Lord, we appreciate the time that we have here to gather up and do the people's business, and we hope that we do it in the way that you'd like us to be, like it to be done. In God's name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mr. Ray. Roll call. Meredith Rayleigh here. Bill England here. Jack Baker here. Julia Coates here. Jody Fishenhawk here. Janelle Fulbright here. Don Garvin. Chuck Poskin here. Tana Glory Jordan. Lee Keener. Oh, man. Dick Lay. Here. Curtis Snell. David Thornton. Present. David Walking Stick. Kara Callan Watts. Oh, honey. We do have a quorum. We have a quorum. Okay, the next shoulder. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, Could we move the nominations to the front of the agenda? Before the minutes or after the minutes? After, after the minutes, sure. Second. Uh, before the report. We have a, a motion to amend the agenda to include items one through seven uh, following the approval of the minutes. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, the agenda is amended. Okay, the next order is approval of the October 10 special session and October 27 regular session minutes. I make a motion that both be approved. Second. second. Motion to approve and second. Any discussion on the minutes as written? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion to stand approved. Okay. Under new business, we'll, we have amended to um, uh, do items one through seven next. But before we do that, because yeah. our reports are getting rather extensive, um, what, unless anybody has special questions for the people on the reports, could we dispense with the oral report and just accept their written report? So moved. Second. Any questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. So those delivering reports, you're welcome to stay. But if you have work you need to be done, then you're welcome to leave. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, this is just for this month, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Unless you want it for the rest of the month. <laughs> <laughs> the new business item one is a resolution confirming the nomination of Brett Taylor uh, as a board member of Cherokee Nation Business. Uh, Ms. Gloria Jordan? Yes. Uh, I'm not certain whether, well, I think we're going to leave the information and the introductions to our liaison. Okay. Right ahead, Ms. On behalf of the Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation, it's my pleasure to nominate Brent Taylor as a board member of the Cherokee Nation Businesses, LLC. Um, Mr. Taylor is here today, should you have any questions of him. Is Brent here, did you say? Yes. Oh, there he is. Do you want to come forward? You need a motion. Yes. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion for Brent Taylor as a board member of the Cherokee Nation. Moved and second. Okay. Mr. Taylor, would you like to say a few words before they go? We have a motion and a second to accept your nomination. Actually, I'd like to you know, uh, say how welcome I feel here today. I actually do feel like I'm among, among family. You know, uh, We actually do all come from one fire. Somehow or another, I'm related to each and every one of you if we go back far enough. Uh, I'm sure we've all got kin folks somewhere, but I, I really do appreciate you being you know, inviting me here today. Thank you very much. You mean you claim relation, relation to the swimmers? <laughs> <laughs> Probably everybody. <laughs> Anybody have any questions of Mr. Taylor? Yes, yes Ms. Um Before we hear from Mr. Taylor, too, or maybe after, I'd like to hear from the principal chief as to the qualifications of why he brought Mr. Taylor forward and, and is supporting him as a nominee. Uh, but I do have a number of questions, too, for Mr. Taylor. Okay. And Ginger, are you... Standing in for uh, I am. Mr. I am. Um, I'll see if he is still here. Okay. Madam okay. Speaker, he is gone at this time. He, he, he was here earlier, but he's gone. Did you want to and uh, respond to Miss Callum Watts' statement? Sure. 
I, I guess I'm concerned because this is our first round of nominees and I expected to hear from the principal chief and I hadn't this met Mr. Taylor till this morning and I thought normally they would reach out and try to meet with us prior to the meeting as well. So I, I really expected the principal chief to be here in order to talk about why these individuals were qualified for $1.33 billion in impact. I'll be glad to answer so, any questions that you've got. Okay, no and I have other questions. Okay, so sure. please, if, if you yeah. would. Yeah. Excuse me? So how, how are you qualified oh, for how this am I qualified? position? Uh, I think Chief Baker probably uh, and I said it best, he had, uh, uh, he campaigned on a uh, platform of bringing business uh, to the Cherokee Nation. Um, I think myself, along with my fellow nominees, I think you'll see we probably got 200 years of business experience. Yeah. Uh, my great-grandfather was a uh, Purd Taylor. He was a uh, U.S. Marshal. Uh, he was uh, interpreter to the uh, Sling Courthouse. My grandfather was uh, Turner Taylor. He owned and operated Turner or uh, Taylor Cleaners there in Prior, Oklahoma, for many years. And then in um, 1963, my father opened Fred Taylor Furniture, okay, uh, which is still open today. Uh, in 1968, we uh, began manufacturing lamps under the name of Betty Jean Lamps. When I say we, that's because uh, when you're in a family business, it's like uh, being a farmer. You know, if uh, the cows need milk or the cotton needs picked, everybody does it. You know. So uh, I've been in business uh, basically from the time I was very small. In 1971, we uh, began selling, uh, buying and selling mobile homes uh, under the name Taylor Mobile Homes. In fact, we sold a mobile home to uh, Jerky Nation, which at the time was a sling courthouse. And uh, in fact, I think that mobile home is still there to this day. Uh, then in 1975, I attended uh, OSU, where I studied uh, aer aeronautical engineering. It didn't take me very long to figure out that engineering wasn't where I needed to be, especially with a, you know, a, a family full of business people. So I transferred to uh, Tahlequah, where I graduated with a degree in uh, business and economics. Uh, in 1980, I uh, opened Fred Taylor Furniture in Claremore, which I owned and operated for 10 years there. And then in 1990, uh, I took over the family business, uh, which was Fred Taylor Enterprises. At that time, I began to diversify Fred Taylor Enterprises in commercial real estate and property. Uh, I began to negotiate leases with uh, some of the largest companies in the United States, including Dollar General. Uh, negotiated with Pizza Hut, the Vita, Dialysis Clinics, uh, Park Creek Music Festivals, which is actually better known as Rocklahoma, is, is who that is. I negotiated property leases with them. Uh, and then in about 1994, uh, I formed Internet America, which was an internet business there in Pryor, Oklahoma. We sold uh, internet access. We were the first uh, company in the United States to sell uh, internet access on an unlimited basis. Uh, prior to that, you paid so much a minute. As a result of being in the internet business, um, I realized that the future of the uh, United States and the world uh, was China. Uh, so in about 1999, I hopped on a plane and I went to China. Uh, uh, went over there, uh, began importing furniture uh, under our own name. We uh, manufactured it, uh, brought it to the United States, sold it through our stores and other stores uh, throughout Northeast Oklahoma. Um, and then uh, opened a buying office in China in about 2002, something like that. Uh, 2003, I was at a trade show in China, and then I saw these big uh, helium balloons. And I said, you know, let's put some of those on a container and bring them over here and see if we can sell them. We did. Uh, as a result, uh, we began selling them to uh, car dealers and real estate agents and that sort of thing. <clears throat> and I realized that uh, you know, the company we were dealing with couldn't uh, you know, keep up with the demand. So in 2005, I opened a joint venture partnership in southern China, uh, which is the name of FTF Jinhan, with a Chinese gentleman by the name of Mr. Kevin Chang. Uh, since 2005, we have uh, expanded three to four times. We currently have a uh, 40,000 square foot operation in southern China with 100 employees, which I manage uh, via the internet and Skype. You know, uh, I literally have my entire life been in business, and I've been in a lot of different businesses. I have a wide range of businesses. I'm not scared of being in business. <clears throat> I approach business uh, as a challenge, you know, and I approach this the same way. One of the things I've done is uh, I requested the minutes from the board meeting for the last year. I've been uh, looking over those minutes to familiarize myself with what the board has been doing in the last year. And might I add that they've been doing a good job. Uh, I'm very proud of what the Cherokee Nation has done. 
But I do feel, like Chief Baker said, this is a great opportunity to take, take the nation from, uh, from good to great. Did Thank I say too much? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what is the largest number of employees you yourself have managed in operation? Well, you know, here in the United States, it's probably uh, 20 or 30. But, you know, internationally, you know, we do have about 100 employees over there. But managing people is, that just is managing people. You have to get down on the ground and you have to know their kids. You have to know their grandkids. You have to know each and everything about them, you know. And I think you'll find that uh, I will probably be one of the most uh, hard-working board members that you've ever had. One of the things I'd like to do is I'd like to go visit each of our businesses. I want to see what we're doing. I, I want to see what we're manufacturing, who's manufacturing, how we can improve it. You know, uh, what, what do we new, need to do to take this nation from good to great? So will you be comfortable uh, with the, really the hands-off, because you're at a high level as a board member and you won't be in day-to-day -day operations because right, that's right. the management you oversee. Right, right. Will that be comfortable for you as a relationship then? You know, I like to be in control. I, I will you know, say that. You know, uh, I like to be a leader. But I don't have any problem giving uh, you know, the day-to-day -day management to somebody else. You can't run a corporation this big by yourself. It can't be done. You know, uh, you've got to have good people underneath of you. And that's the secrets to get good people underneath of you. But yeah, and no, I don't have any problem with that. Okay. Do you have any prior or current business relationships with the Cherokee Nation or any of our entities? No, I do not. Neither never, prior nor current. No, never have had. No. So you, not me personally. I have not. Okay, had so it wasn't you. Maybe your dad that owned a smoke shop or something. No, I've never owned a smoke shop. My brother owned some smoke shops, but no, I've never. My, my father passed away in 1992. Okay, yeah. thank you. No problem. So, may I continue? So, um, do you know what the tarot law is? I'm familiar with tarot, right? I mean, somewhat. And I'll be honest, that's an area that we need to improve. Uh, I've been in business all my life, and I didn't even really know what Tara was up until about a year ago. Uh, that's something that uh, the business people need to know more about. You know? uh, and we need to promote that for people because competition is good. You know, the more people that we get bidding on a project, the more money that's going to save the Cherokee Nation. But I, I am familiar with it to, to some degree. So from a policy level, how would you implement tarot at CNB and for our other business entities? When you say implement it, you mean how would we get people registered with tarot? So from a policy perspective, how would you ask the management to implement the tarot law? Well, uh, I think they're doing a pretty good job the way they are as far as, you know, getting it, you know, to the people. but. The problem is that people don't know that it's there. You know, we've got to notify people like bricklayers and carpenters and stuff that they need to be tarot certified because a lot of these people don't even know it. You know, uh, or they're scared of it. You know, uh, they don't know what it is they're scared of. They're afraid. You know, somebody told them, "Oh yeah, you've got to be tarot certified." Oh, what's tarot? You know, uh, one of the things we need to do is we need to get uh, more information to the people. I think. Let me ask it a different way. So. Um this body normally has felt in the past that if there's a five or ten percent difference uh, on a contract uh -huh. and um, there's a tarot vendor and a non tarot right. vendor that bids a multi million dollar project for right. the casino, for example, construction's easy for folks to get their head around. Um, if there's only a five percent difference, uh, we'll just use five. Point of order, I don't know that the body has ever even discussed that. Discuss what? This five to ten percent differential that she's talking about. That's fine. If I'll just for the for for the record, then let it reflect that this is a scenario that is non-specific to anyone. I'm just asking a yeah, question. Yeah, I, I don't have any problem answering the question. So, I just need to understand exactly what we're talking about. May I continue? About. Thank you. So, how would you ask CNB or any of the other entities um, as a policy set by the board? Would you give preference to a tarot vendor uh, who's within some percentage, whether it's five percent or one percent, uh, over a quarter two? He he is just one person on an entire board, so he can't tell us what he can do. Only the board, as a group, can tell us what they can do. I think she's asking mm -hmm. his philosophy in regard to this. Is yes, Madam Chair. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. So, I mean, if, if it was your vote on the board for setting a policy, um, 
how I want to gauge how strongly you feel about tarot preference. And should we should we give an advantage to Cherokees? Is that what you're saying? Yes. And has the advantage been determined? Is it is it set at five percent or is it set at ten percent? There's always there's policies. Yeah. There's law. Yeah. I mean, those yeah. are always moving targets. But you as a board yeah. member would yeah. set. Yeah. the tone for right, how right. we treat tarot contracting mm -hmm. uh, and that is a significant we, portion, portion of purchasing power within the Cherokee right, Nation right, economy right, right, right. is the board you're going to be on. Number one, we need to put Cherokee people to work. Okay, uh, I think Cherokee people need to come first. You know, uh, it's, it's their money you know, that we're spending. Uh, the 80, 90 million dollars that we've got, it's their money. Uh, to spend it outside the Cherokee Nation to me doesn't make a lot of sense. You know. Uh, I think you know, there's times that we're going to have to, you know, uh, you know, we can't always find the people that we need at home. Uh, we can try and train those people, but uh, I think, yeah, we need to give them some advantage uh, if possible. I, I don't know exactly what that percentage needs to be. It's something that, you know, the board and I would probably need to discuss. But you would not be opposed to it, then? Opposed to giving Cherokees an advantage? Like, the preference and possibly an advantage no. on contracting. No. Please be quiet. It's distracting. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my apologies, Mr. No, Taylor. that's no, no problem. So, because um, this is extremely important, and this is the first time I've had a chance to visit with you, and well, that's a, okay. in a position of public trust, yeah. it's important that we have this dialogue in public. Right. That's fine. So, yeah, no problem. Um, have. I have some other questions too, and this is in regards on more of the disclosure and ethics. So you've mm -hmm. already said that you have no uh, business relationship or prior business relationship. No, never have. So did you donate to any of the principal chief candidates? Sure. Okay, yes, and, and if so, how much and to whom? Well, over uh, to Chief Baker, you know, okay. and uh, over the you know uh, time of two elections and recounts and counts and recounts, uh, I did donate probably the maximum amount. Uh, which is $5,000. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Then also, um, if you were asked to do anything illegal or unethical by anyone, uh, especially an elected official, how would you respond in your position? I wouldn't do it to begin with and my wife would kill me. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a very, uh, very moral man. You know, uh, I study my Bible every day. Uh, in fact, uh, my wife gave me a, a little note, you know, before I left, you know, says, uh, you know, when God calls you to do something, uh, He will equip you to do it. You know, so uh, I'm a very moral man, and uh, you know, if somebody asks me to do something illegal, uh, I'm not going to do it. Uh, if, if possible, I'm going to notify the proper people to see that that gets taken care of. So, I have two more questions. Okay, sure. So, there's a number of gaming licenses, and in fact, we just I think an 80 billion dollar contract. Is it, or 80 million, excuse me, 80 million, I'm adding zeros, yay. Okay, so, when I get done, it'll be 80 billion. Yeah, so 80, so 80, that's the next question. So 80 million dollar Department of Defense contract, I believe the application is 29 pages. Okay. So um, there's a multi-part question on this first one. So number one, you're willing to fill out all these applications. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's something you have to do, it's just part of any job. Okay, and number two, you feel like you can pass those FBI level background checks sure, no problem. and all the None. other divorce None. gaming license, National gaming all. license. It's a lengthy process, but I have no problems at all. Yeah. Okay. So we have been really successful uh, as an Indian tribe and as part of Oklahoma's economy. What are some of those ideas, uh, specific ideas that you have? Because I, I would hope you've considered this greatly so you would yeah. have something to right, share right, right. on where you think we need to be to grow that economy and the dividend back to the tribe. The, the Cherokee Nation is at a spot, it's an enviable position that we haven't had in probably 200 years. You know, uh, we've got, as I understand, 80, 90 million dollars in the bank. Uh, the casinos make a lot of money, but they spend a lot of money. Uh, if we don't invest it wisely, uh, those things eat like a monster. Uh, that money can be gone in a heartbeat. We've got to invest that money, and I believe diversify. I think we need to put it into something uh, and continue gaming uh, to some degree, uh, but we need to diversify and get into energy, you know, an energy field, whether it be hydroelectric, gas fire, coal, uh, you know, fusion. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities out there. Uh, 
the energy up week is one of the best ways to, to do that because that's a long-term investment that will help uh, the Cherokee Nation. Uh, people are always going to need energy. You know, I think uh, I think energy is probably the best way. I'm, I've got some uh, ideas on the on the, on the back burner that uh, I think would help put the Cherokee Nation uh, on the map. Thank you for your time. Okay, today, no Mr. problem. Taylor. Thank you. Thank I, you, I, I appreciate Chair. all the questions. I appreciate too. The time. Uh, Mr. Yes, sir. I read your resume. Yes. I was impressed with your diversity. Thank you very much. I was impressed with your international market experience. Thank you. I know uh, you might not have reached out to all of us, but I know I picked up the phone and called you. Yeah. My question for you is, are you Cherokee? Am I Cherokee? Yes, I am. Yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. sir. Yeah. My, my uh, great-grandfather, uh, Alfred Perd Taylor, was uh, on the rolls. Yeah. And the other thing is I was wanting to tell you is our tarot is not law. It's not written into the law. It was an executive order <clears> at the last minute that left a lot of loose ends that we're okay. going to address again. Okay. And we would like your your um, input on that to see some of your beliefs. We might need to send it by you to okay. get the board to understand we are serious okay. about Terrell this it, year. It's, yeah, because it's not completely clear, you know. Uh, so it's something that I think, <coughs> yeah, needs some work, I think. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a great opportunity for the Cherokee people, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you for accepting some of our calls when you want to. No problem. No problem okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, Mr. Lay. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Morning. Okay. Uh, I, I took it upon myself because this gentleman lives in my district to call him and I, I once I called him I realized I had previously <coughs> met him at some event somewhere. And, and so I don't know about these folks making themselves available to us. I mean I went out and made myself available to him which is probably a better way to do it. And, and I was impressed with him. He and I talked about Cherokee first hiring. And we talked about a lot of things about business, the things that he had done. I'm impressed with him. Uh, and the Tayro laws need a lot of work, as Kara and Jody had just said. And I believe we give something like a 4.5% slide on Tayro and I I, this is the first I've heard about a possible 10%. And so I, I'm not sure where that's coming from, but I have only been there three months. And so uh, I guess the thing that, that impresses me the most is he's willing to go over there and do what I consider a tough job. Uh, it's uh, it, That's not going to be an easy job over there. We've got in my opinion, some, some areas that need some improvement on Cherokee first hiring, especially with C&E. Uh, the Ramona Casino job is uh, under 50% Cherokee. Uh, and so there are a lot of areas that we can improve, and, and Mr. Taylor has told me that he wants to work towards that. Right. And so I'm going to support him in his nomination. Thank you. Mr. Gordon. <clears throat> yes, I just have one question. Sure. Uh, most of the other ones have been answered, so. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> I, I can so, see some easy uh, ones, that's fine. <laughs> what I really want to know is how you feel about uh, new business. If you happen to purchase a new business, would you bring that business into the Cherokee Nation? If possible, not, yes. not have it outside the nation? Maybe start up a new business uh, inside the Cherokee Nation. I want to tell you that uh, we have different districts here. Right. And my district is uh, a lot of low income. Right, right. And we need something there to build on. And we don't have industry there that, that we need. Right. And anything that we can get into the, the district right. would help. You know, tremendously, just anything. Yeah, and I agree with and, you totally. And you have to realize that by hiring Cherokees, that you also receive tax breaks. Right. And uh, we also have uh, uh, land on the river down there that, uh, you know, you could use for bringing in a business. And uh, I know that they would much like to bring uh, a business into land that is owned by Cherokees and it uh, has something to do with the tax exemption. I, I agree. We, we need to look at those areas where, where the incomes are not up to where they should be. Uh, if we can move a business into that area that's going to employ those people, that's absolutely what we need to do. Uh, there's places, uh, you know, I'm from Salina, 
you know, uh, it's, it's not a high income area. You know, Kenwood, you know, Spavanaugh, those are, those are not high income areas. Uh, but you know, anytime we can get a, a job in there, uh, you know, something that people can do, sure, you know, we, we need to do that. And, and buying businesses off in Colorado or California or someplace like that, that's something we need to think about. You know, because those really aren't providing uh, jobs for Cherokees. You know, they may be providing a little bit of cash. You know, I, I'm not sure because you know, I'm not close enough to the situation. You know, if they're providing some cash, well, maybe you know, then we can use that cash to, to build something else here. You know, but we need to look at, at uh, what we're doing outside. Uh, American Airlines had a, a really good plan several years ago, as did Walmart. One of the things they did was they required all of their vendors to locate within a 50 mile radius of Tulsa. And Walmart said, you know, Bentonville. If you look at that area, if you look at what happened to Tulsa, look at what happened to Bentonville, when all those vendors were forced into that area, the economy just exploded. You know? So we need to keep those businesses as close to home as possible. But I, I agree with you totally. Yeah, I think uh, mainly that uh, you as a businessman and this board can put together a package <clears throat> that a company would really look at and uh, could see that they would have a big advantage if they did come into this Right, area. right. And uh, I appreciate you being on there. Thank you. I appreciate, appreciate you accepting this. And the reason I didn't get to all of you is I like to meet people in person. You know, if I can, I like to shake somebody's hand. Uh, phone call, uh, the internet, it's a little bit impersonal to me sometimes. So I'm sorry if I didn't get to, to each of you. But, you know, I, I, I've tried to introduce myself to each of you who came in today. But thank you very much. Well, I was one of the last ones in. I guess that <laughs> makes me a bit because I sat in the back. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you. Uh, I think you uh, will represent the nation in a great way and a great form. I think that's what you're here for. I look forward. I look forward some to of it. your people, and I know that's what they expect. Thank you. Know? you. And uh, so, you know, I've never saw a person that's been interviewed for one of these positions interviewed in such a way that we've interviewed this morning. Oh. I, I never <laughs> Is that saw good or bad? that many questions <laughs> asked other appointees that was appointed in the last administration. But uh, I appreciate you, Kurt. No problem. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Did you walk in uh, uh, Well, there's a lot of good questions asked. Sure. And I really like your concept of leadership. Thank you. On uh, putting people around you that can do your job better than you can. So that's good. And I'm also impressed with your, uh, with your ethics and your morals. Thank you. Your faith in God. Thank you. I, I do have a deep faith. Yeah. We need more people like that in our tribe that's going to lead our nation. Thank you. Uh, but with that being said, I'd like to call the question. We have uh, two more that have, need to ask questions. Okay. No, three more. Mr. Keener? Yes. Good morning, Mr. Yes, Dad. Pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Uh, you said you had a furniture business for 10 years? In Claremore. Yes. Yeah. What happened to you? Uh, you know, it came time uh, for my father to retire. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and then any business, there's just a time to take over the business. And that's when I took it over was in about 1990, which uh, was a good time because he passed away two years later. And, uh, you know, it was just uh, the right time, you know, took over the business. Uh, during the 1990s, it's diff it was difficult. Uh, it's still difficult to find good help. Uh, so rather than uh, continue the operation, we just closed it out because you, know, you got to have people that you can trust. Uh, for some reason, the 90s it was a difficult time. Everybody was at work. It was a good time. You know, they were advertising on the radio for people to come to work. You know, that, that, you know, that, that's how hard it was to, to get you know, good people. So we just closed it out, and I concentrated there in prior. And you said you had, your brother did own a smoke shop or does own He does own smoke shops, yeah. He's, he's got one in uh, Pryor and then a couple in Tulsa. You know, I'm not sure exactly where they are, you know, Pine Street or something like that. And then could you briefly share some of the long-range ideas you had, you mentioned? Energy, diversification, I think, is number one. Uh, we've got to prepare ourselves. You know, gaming's good, but it may not always be good. We've got competition out there. We've got competition from uh, the Choctaws, uh, the Osage. I mean, everybody's opening a casino, uh, and that's just in Oklahoma. Uh, with the economy the way it is, you know, it's just a matter of time for you know, Arkansas or Kansas. Uh, they decided to open some casinos along the border. The reason those people are coming to casinos isn't because we're Cherokees, it's because we've got a casino. You know? and we've got to prepare ourselves for the time when uh, the gaming isn't what it is. Uh, we're, we're at a wonderful crossroads in the Cherokee Nation. 
but we've got to figure out what we're going to do with this money so that it will grow the business over the next 20, 40, or 50 years. You know, uh, energy, I do believe, my personal opinion, energy is the best way to do it. Energy is going to be here from now on. Uh, we can take energy, we can uh, produce it, we can sell it to uh, other co-ops. Uh, biggest problem is transmission lines. Uh, but we could partner with somebody like GRDA or the RECs or KMO or somebody like that. Uh, but I think energy is a great opportunity for us. We've got the money to do it. Uh, and I think we could you know, pull it off and provide great jobs, high paying jobs. Uh, you know, some of them technical, some of them not necessarily so technical. But I think energy is a good field. That's, that's one I'm interested in looking at. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Baker. Yes, I would like to ask for a friendly amendment to the resolution. I passed out some language that Mr. Hembree drafted. It said the approval is contingent upon the appointee applying for and receiving all applicable licenses and clearances needed to perform the functions of office. Second. If said appointee fails to receive said licenses or clearance within a reasonable time, the approval is rescinded. No, I ask for a friendly amendment. Oh. Uh, who, who made the motion? <laughs> I would like for you to name the appropriate devices. The gaming license, and then there's, with our Department of Defense contracts, there's certain security clearances in the Department of Defense. David, I think Mr. Stewart's here. Yeah, Mr. Stewart right? is here. We want to ask him. Dave, you want to come forward just for a second? Yeah, I think we provided yeah. uh, all yeah. of the uh, nominees package of information with the application and the information they've all looked at that and they've all acknowledged that they would pull out the forms uh, the uh, I think the the provision that says you can't be a board member if you can't pass the clearance is appropriate because we can't do business unless we you know we get that so I think all the candidates understand all the nominees understand that so uh, I think that, that's not an inappropriate amendment to this uh, the candidates have <clears throat> filled out an acknowledgement that they will sign, you know, they will make the application and they're not adverse to uh, providing the information. Thank you. Is that correct? I see. Yeah. yeah. We'd like to give some more time to this process. Yeah, I, I guess I had a question if Todd, is Todd available? Uh, I just, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, is this not? I mean, I implicit or explicit anywhere in the law that they couldn't serve without those. I'm just curious. I'm just wondering if this is. Was it the um, uh, uh, passage contingent upon them? I mean, I mean, aren't they, don't they have to be qualified to hold the seat anyway? Well, that's part of the qualification for holding the seat, but this makes it explicit that, you know, the, that the approval that we're, that the, the council is giving here is contingent upon the, uh, all applicants uh, uh, receiving the uh, appropriate uh, 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 licenses and, and, and applications. Will the so. license process, maybe uh, Mr. Chair can ask this, will the license process be done by the time we get to the full council? No, no, it, it's going to be a lengthy process. That's why it needs to be in a, 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 a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and that's, I know, a subjective standard, but uh, for instance, some of the clearance, uh, military clearance, could take months. So, so does order. this effectively mean that they won't hold their seat no. until uh, no. this is yeah, what, what the government kind of, yeah. okay. the government will allow us to have board members contingent upon filing and filling out you know the forms and getting into the process what they do is they, they issue a conditional or provisional uh, clearance and then they go through additional process and then that might take another two or three months but uh, I, I think the government would tell us that we could not get a contract if we didn't have all the board members that met the test. So if we decided to have one board member that could not pass, then we would not get the contract. So I, I understand what you're saying. It's implicit, uh, but it, it would be an issue. Well, I'm, cons I'm concerned, too, about the timing. I think the councilman said that it's not his intent, but this, this language wouldn't operate to prevent <clears throat> Mr. Taylor, for example, from taking his seat on CMB right after next council meeting that if we approve him at that point. Is that, I just want to make sure that I understand how the language operates. To, I will answer to the best of my knowledge. To the best of my knowledge is that it wouldn't prevent any nominee from uh, accepting the, uh, uh, the office and performing based on a contingent 
uh, application pending to contingent uh, uh, licenses. Um, and uh, I believe that there'd be no hindrance to them effectively, you know, uh, starting immediately to uh, uh, perform their, their, their duties. Mr. Huffman or Mr. Stewart may yeah, add something on that. Name, that that's the way it's happened in the past. Aren't some of them going to top secret clearance now? Yes. Okay. And, so does that okay. answer? I think it does. I'm just, I, I think Councilman Baker's answer. Can I ask Councilman Baker a question? Mm -hmm. Sure. Your, your intent, you don't envision this stopping Mr. Taylor, for example, no, from no, no. taking office no, if he's approved. In the it's just that if we have a, someone who's appointed to the board that does not meet these qualifications, I don't want us to lose out on Department of Defense contracts or any other contracts. Okay. I just want to make sure that the board can operate. I don't approve it. Okay. I, I accept. Accept. Mr. Baker, are you finished? Yes, finally? thank you. Mr. Coates, <laughs> Ms. Coates. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Taylor, thank you for being here today. Thank you very and, much. Uh, responding to our questions. Approximately how many hours a week would you anticipate um, spending in service to the Cherokee Nation businesses board? Well, I can tell you how much I've already spent. Uh, I've gone over the minutes uh, for the last uh, year. Uh, that's quite lengthy, uh, going through and, and understanding all of some of the acronyms, uh, which uh, there's a lot of acronyms that, that I still don't understand, like uh, ECHO, you know, there's a, there's a reference to ECHO in there. I don't, I don't understand what that is, you know. Uh, I've probably already got, uh, you know, 20 to 40 hours in studying already. Um, whatever it takes, you know, if, if I can do it in, uh, you know, five hours a week, that's fine. If it takes me 40 hours a week, that's what I'll do. Um, what, how do you feel, last night the council passed a uh, legislation um, which is, was triggered by the possibility of the United Couture Band being able to put land into trust. Uh, how do you feel about that particular issue and its potential impacts on our businesses? Well, I, I need to know a little more about it. Why? You know, why are they putting land in trust? Is it for a casino? Is that is that the, the bottom line? Or that uh, may be down the road. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, and I, you know, I'm sure that's probably what they're interested in. You know, they they need a way of providing for their people. Uh, they are a separate band of the Cherokee Nation, as is the the Eastern Band. You know, and we need to respect their rights. Um, you know, the fact that uh, they uh, I'm sorry, I must have said something wrong. Yeah, you know. uh, but. You know, uh, they're still our folks. You know, they're still our family. You know, if uh, if they need to do something that uh, you know competes with us, you know, uh, and we don't like that, you know, I think that's probably just a way of growing. You know, uh, they've got the casino here in town now. You know, I don't know enough about that operation as to how it competes or how it affects our casinos, but that's another reason that we need to diversify. You know. If, if we're upset just because they're going to open a casino that competes with ours, uh, that's not a good reason to be upset. You know, We need to go out, and the one thing you need to know when you're in business, you need to know who your competition is. You need to know what their capabilities are. And uh, you know, we need to find out exactly why they're going to put land in trust, if it's for a casino. You know, I don't know enough about the tribal laws as to whether we could prevent it or not, or whether we even should prevent it. Uh, but. They are our folks. They're, they're, they're still family. As a follow-up to that, what is your level of familiarity with federal Indian law and its impacts on uh, the way that we run our businesses? You know, federal Indian law is not something that I'm familiar with. Uh, I, I'm a businessman. You know, uh, people like Mr. Embry and some of the others, that's, that's their expertise. I'd have to defer to them on any area like that. Uh, I'm you know, just not familiar with that. You, um, you mentioned a couple of times that uh, you started looking at the minutes of the CNB board about a year ago. You started looking at Tarot uh, about a year ago. Was there something specifically that happened a year ago that triggered your interest? In yeah, you know, I think you know. Just uh, I think somebody mentioned it. You know, I think somebody said Tarot. You know, was that the uh, present principal chief by any <coughs> chance who may no, have led you to no. believe that this position might be made available to you? No, I don't think it was that. I think it was just uh, you know when you're in business, kind of just a general knowledge. Maybe somebody had had said uh, they were a contractor and, and they were tarot certified. And 
first time I heard it, I, I, I didn't understand what they meant, you know. Uh, so it required some research, you know. And uh, in fact, just up until uh, a few weeks ago, I, I really wasn't completely understanding how it worked, you know, the advantage that the Cherokee people had. Uh, but I think it's a good idea to give the Cherokee people an advantage any, any time we can because we've been disadvantaged for too many years. I mean, let's face it, Cherokee people have been beat down. You know, we've been beat down with a stick, you know, and this is our opportunity to, to come back up, you know. Uh, we need to educate all of our people. Every one of them that we can, we've got to educate. You know. We've got to bring those people up to a level where they can get jobs that pay good. You know, Minimum wage isn't enough to make it anymore. You know, $8, $9 an hour isn't going to cut it. And uh, if the economy continues the way it is, it's going to be $20 an hour. Uh, so we've got to get those people educated and get them into those positions and provide those jobs where they can get a position uh, that, that pays good. Um, I'm somebody else that... Um uh, on this council, and I understand that there are a lot of us and everything, but uh, I uh, you said that you had reached out to a number of people. I was not one of them, and I'm I just wondered if sorry. you could share with us who, who it was that you did reach out to. Uh, the people that I could, that I met, uh, just as, you Can know. Can you give uh, us uh, names uh, of uh, which ones uh, on this uh, council? Ms. Meredith, uh, Ms. Meredith Fraley. I stopped by and talked to her the other day, just introduced myself. You didn't buy um, any chicken either. <laughs> what she, what'd she say? <laughs> Oh, no, I didn't either. It was late. Yeah. Uh, I was actually on my way back from Tahlequah. I'd done something here. I don't remember now. Uh, Mr. Lay, uh, you know, I introduced myself to him. Or he actually introduced himself to me, uh, Miss Fishing Hawk. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll clear that up. I called him. She called me. Yeah, yeah she I called me. I reached out to him right. to get to know uh, who he was. Uh, of course, Mr. Hoskins, uh, you know, I met him, you know, um, and uh, I think the rest of it is probably the first time I've ever met you, you know, but I really do feel like I'm family. I mean, we really are, you know, we're not going to all get along all the time. You're, does anybody know any family that does get along all the time? Trust me, mine doesn't, but that's part of the process, you know, uh, especially when you're in business. When my family gets together, we argue. You know, my, my kids hate it, you know, but we argue. That's that's how we develop uh, what we're going to do. And, uh, you know, we don't talk about the neighbor's cat or their kids. We talk about business, you know, and that's what we need to do here. We've got to bring this nation back together, you know. Uh, it's divided. Uh, it, it's been divided for a number of years, I think. Whatever it does to bring it back, if we don't work together, we don't stand a chance. We've got to work together. And, and I want to work with you. I want to work with Ms. Watts, who, whoever it is. I'm a little bit of an outsider on this. I don't know all of you, but at the same time, I don't have the preconceived notions, okay? So uh, I'm here to work for the people, you know. Um, you know I, I hope I can please you all the time, but, uh, but I hope I uh, make a profit for the Cherokee people. That's, that's my bottom line. And my last, um, my last question, thank you for the indulgence here. Uh, you mentioned energy uh, as mm -hmm. a, an area of diversification, and uh, this body has at a number of times um, expressed an interest in um, um, sort of a, the environmental impacts uh, of, uh, of all of our projects, mm -hmm. uh, basically, whether it's with the government or, or through the businesses. Mm -hmm. Can you share your perspectives uh, on that aspect? On how energy, energy would... Um, uh, you know, one of my major concerns is water, you know, our environment. Yeah what we're doing to our environment. Uh, we've got a very limited amount of time to uh, take care of our water systems. I think uh, this summer was a good example with the uh, blue algae thing. I think we saw what was happening with the pollution that was going into the, into the waterways. A lot of that probably comes from chicken waste. You know? uh, those people make a good living with their chicken farms. Uh, we need to find a way so that uh, that is less polluting if possible or maybe even another uh, business where they make even more money you know uh, we can't take those people's livelihood away but we need to find a way to provide another source of income for them or a less polluting source of income uh, as far as you know how energy is going to hurt our environment uh, you know coal-fired obviously would you know coal-fired uh, re requires a lot to keep it clean uh, gas is somewhat cleaner uh, of course, wind and solar are uh, very, you know, clean. The problem with wind is transmission. You can put a wind plant, uh, you know, up in the northern part of, the, you know, Oklahoma, but you got to get the power lines out, and it's, it's too expensive. You know, so wind is probably not really a viable option. Uh, but there's some technology coming down the road that, uh, you know, with the possibility of fusion. I don't know if you know what fusion is or not. Fusion, fusion, you know, is the power of the sun. You know. 
you know, it's a dream right now, uh, but in 10 to 20 years, it'll be a reality. And when we get fusion, uh, trust me, uh, you know, Katie bar the door, you know, it, energy will be for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. The question has been called, and I think everyone that's spoken that wants to speak that hasn't spoke before. So the question has been called. Chair, I just had one question for the principal chief's office. Uh, the clarify. question. The question has been called. Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Aye. Did you get the? Yeah. Uh -huh. Mr. Taylor, thank you for your time. Thank you. You did good. Are you tired? <laughs> no, no, you know, actually, I look forward to this meeting. You know, uh, it's a challenge for me. I get bored after a while, you know. And, uh, this is going to be a great challenge. I look forward to it. I really do look forward to working with each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item two in terms of nomination of Bob Berry as a board member of Cherokee Nation Business. Um, Yes, on behalf of the Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation, it's my pleasure to nominate Mr. Bob Berry as a board member of Cherokee Nation Businesses, LLC. Mr. Berry is here today if you have any questions of him. Do I have a motion? Yes, I'll move. Yes, second. Okay. Mr. Berry, you want to come forward? For that last applicant, I'm not sure I want one. <laughs> <laughs> Barry, you want to tell us a little bit about why you want to serve on the CMB board? And then we'll, then we'll open up for questions. Why I'm qualified? No, why do well, you I'll leave that to, to, the, to the group here. I'll give you a little bit uh, of my background. <clears throat> my mother was born in Indian Territory over between Westville and Stillwell. My grandfather on my mother's side is buried over there in the cemetery just east of uh, 59 Highway. Uh, they came from northern Georgia to Indian Territory. And, uh, that's where my mom was, was born in 1898. <clears throat> I grew up in Delaware County on Honey Creek and uh, went to school at Grove. Came to Tahlequah to Northeastern as one of ten children of number nine. I was the only one to go to college out of my uh, family. I happened to have been born in California. My parents in 29 uh, starved out and went to Arizona and homesteaded. And they fruit tramped in the valley of California. And I happened to be born in 1938 out there in the fall. <clears throat> when the war started, my dad got a job in the shipyards in Vallejo. And he did move the family back to Oklahoma and I grew up from 41, uh, I hear of the depressions in the 30s. I don't know about them, but we had a depression on Honey Creek in the 40s. It was uh, tough times. And I graduated from Grove in 56, uh, came to Northeastern, and graduated here in 61. Went to, went to school five years, and have a degree in math and chemistry, and I got my parents didn't have any money, so I got a job at the old Ozark Nursery. All of you that have roots here, go back, know of Ozark. And uh, it wasn't long, I was running a loaded truck loading crew. Uh, I look back, one, one thing my parents taught me was the knowledge of how to work. It's the most valuable asset that I ever had from anybody, was the knowledge of how to work. And it wasn't long, I had a boss job. I was getting paid big money three and a quarter an hour, uh, time and a half for overtime because I was loading interstate commerce trucks. So I was really in the chips. But uh, anyway, upon graduation, I took a sales job and traveled for the company in the upper Midwest and saw the company was not doing what it needed to do. And in 1968, after eight years on the road for them, I uh, quit and started my own business. And I built two companies, uh, the one that I just recently sold has about 3,500 employees scattered around in uh, seven states in the nation. We're the largest supplier of plants to Lowe's, to Walmart. Uh, we do sell a little bit to Depot. We backed away from them a couple of years ago. 
and we're back in this year on a limited basis. We do sell a lot of independents, uh, landscapers and people like that, but that part of the business is shrinking. The economy is driving the business to the big boxes, and that's where the bulk of our business is. I have taken a, com a company public. Uh, I know what it means to do that. It's not easy. It's a challenge. I've operated in a public environment with the reports and all that type of stuff. I've dealt with most of the big banks in the country, from Citicorp to Bank of America, the Old Republic in Dallas, first of Chicago, and I've never left a bank that uh, I didn't pay every penny of interest and principal. Uh, I'm 72 years old. I'm starting to, I guess, ready to turn over more of the executive de decisions that I've had on my shoulders in the last 40 years to my son and other people. I recently bought a farm down in Choctaw County on the Red River. I have a few cattle there. I live here in Cherokee County. Uh, my family uh, owns a golf course. I live on the golf course up on, on uh, number 16 Green. If any of you have ever played the course, you know where I live. Having built a couple of businesses without money, money to start with, I've leveraged myself uh, to, uh, I think, to be quite successful uh, by building businesses without money. And you can do it if you have determination and, uh, and desire to do so. Having said that, I'll uh, open it to questions and you can, I'll try to answer your question. Thank you. Mr. Wapiestick? Uh, I'd like to call the question. Fine. No. Uh, Point of order. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, you can call for the okay. question, but we have several people that haven't talked. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, Mr. Baker. Yes. I'm asking for the same printing amendment as before. And I might add that uh, I don't perceive any problems with any of the candidates not receiving these licenses or clearances. But in case one should not, I would also expect that if they did not, that they would resign from the board. But I was going to protect us in case that did not happen. Yes, I just asked them for a minute. I accept. Accept. Who second? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Coates. I. I want to remind all of us, um, nominees and the, and the council both, that we are looking at people today who are going to take over the operations, the, or the, uh, direct the operations of, a, 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 um, of companies that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And so the expectation should be uh, that there will be questions and that there will be lengthy questions. And efforts to call the question without any of us being able to ask those questions are offensive to me. Uh, when we are putting people in here uh, who are going to bear great, great responsibility, that's just the height of irresponsibility on our part, it seems like. So I just yeah. wanted to make that objection, uh, first of all. Um, I would ask the, the, the same question uh, of Mr. Barry that uh, I did of Mr. Taylor because I do think that this is a very serious question and uh, just ask uh, for your comments about uh, how you feel the UKB placing land into trust uh, impacts our business. That's probably uh, should be left to the chief, the policy decision. Okay. and. Uh, as far as uh, my personal opinion, uh, I'd probably want to collaborate with the people on the board and the chief and hear what he has to say on it. Is this an issue that you're familiar with? I am. Can you tell me what your understanding of the issue is? Well, I probably don't understand it to the extent that this group does, but uh, as I understand it, if uh, as, as it relates to casinos, it has to be approved by the U.S. government in trust before uh, a casino can be built. And uh, uh, as to the policy of the tribe, the Cherokee tribe, 
uh, toward anyone else, I would defer that to the leadership of the tribe. And if, if the chief, uh, who has just recently been elected, says uh, he's going to oppose it, then I'd have to go with him. Or if he's going to say that he wouldn't fight it, I'd have to kind of side with him. Because I don't think, I'm a businessman, but I, I certainly don't have a, a real deep feeling on uh, whether we ought to get in a fight with, with another uh, faction of the uh, Cherokee Nation. So I'd defer that to, uh, to uh, a time when I've had some in-depth discussion on it with the people that are in a position to know better than I. Ms. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Berry, for being here today. Um, so, how, um, how many employees does your company, does it manage? Approximately, in the peak of the spring, we'll, we'll hit as high as 3,500 people. Excellent. So, uh, and thank you for that economy, I guess. Here in northeastern Oklahoma. Well, we've, we've contributed some. Very good. So how, um, have you served on other business boards? Uh, I have I served on another? I see, yeah, I didn't see it on your resume, but I thought somebody that maybe that was just not listed. Well, I served as chairman of the State Highway Commission under Henry Bellman in his last term for four years. And um, I, I think I'd like to claim responsibility for getting the Southwest Bypass built. Uh, high priority on my uh, uh, programming was the four-laning of the road to Muskogee, which we got done after I left the board, but my programming wasn't changed. And the third priority I had was for a super two-laning the road down to Standing Rock. And I see it just recently been done. And it's amazing how long it takes to get those things. That was programmed in 1989 and it just got completed. But I, I feel uh, good about the roads that I brought to uh, the Tahlequah area when I was on that commission. Okay. And I also served under Joe Bird uh, on the same commission that I'm, or the board that I'm uh, asking you people to prove for me back to. So just to clarify, you served uh, on the gaming business or the bingo hall board during Joe Bird's administration? That's right. I was uh, chairman of the board for, I believe, three years. Okay. Um, so do you have any prior or current business relationships with the Cherokee Nation or any of our business entities? No. Um, what about the United Katua Band, the Shawnee, or the Delaware? No. Okay. And um, if you... Um, were asked to do something illegal or unethical by anyone in your position on the board, how would you respond? Obviously, I would refuse <clears throat> to do anything illegal. And if I felt it should be reported to somebody of superior position, I would do that too. Okay. And, and have you donated or your spouse donated to any principal chief candidate? And if so, who and how much? I have to uh, Chief uh, Baker, uh, 5000 Okay. And then um, also, if uh, do you understand the tarot law? You know, I really don't. I have uh, I have lost myself in my own business work and really have not uh, paid too much attention to Indian laws and things like that. I was interested in the questions you ask, and uh, I kind of deducted that uh, it has to do with contractors being qualified and. Uh, approved under certain regulations and I'll just have to make myself familiar with that but right now I really am kind of ignorant of it. Now Paul, I had to step out when you were introducing yourself. You are a Cherokee citizen, correct? Yes I am. Okay, so let me ask more broadly. How do you feel about preference in contracting, which is one question under Tarot, and how do you feel about hiring and promotions of individuals for our entities? Well, another if the ruling body whether it's this body here or the board that uh, uh, I'm looking at setting on, if they don't support the nation, then who is? And I think, I think the, uh, the uh, members of the Cherokee Nation need preference uh, 
especially in the uh, job areas, employment areas. Uh, that's, I feel very strong about that. As far as uh, having uh, people that uh, are qualified to do contracting or construction work or whatever type of work it might be, uh, definitely it would be my preference to see the Cherokee people uh, show more entrepreneurial spirit and come up with the job with the uh, with the businesses that can do the Cherokee's work than going outside the nation. Okay, so um, in, you are familiar that it's the Cherokee Nation Gaming Commission, the Horse Racing <coughs> Commission license, alcohol, the Able Commission or Alcohol and Beverage <coughs> Laws Enforcement Commission license, and then it's Department of Security Services for the Department of Defense, top secret security. You even have to tell them your, if you have prior spouses or spouses and list all these great things about yourself in detail and you're comfortable with that, correct? I glanced through it. It's pretty detailed, but I do have a secretary that's real good. So okay. I probably would try to fill the thing out. If she did a good job, I'd, uh, you know, I can get it done. So how much personal time are you able and willing to commit and expect to commit to this position? Well, uh, you know, I've, I've run uh, the nursery uh, that I put together was a $300 million business and I still had time for certain outside things and I'm really divorced a lot from that today. Uh, I still have some hands-on things that I do but you know if it's uh, 10 to 15, 20 hours a month I can do that. And if it's demanding of me I'll take whatever time is necessary to focus on a project or uh, an endeavor to uh, see it to a decision. It, it, and I'm not speaking to this amount because I know that the work that the past board members has put in, even with some kind of compensation, has really been a donation to the Cherokee people, given the value of their time. But what compensation were you told you would receive? Because I understood, and I, I apologize, I got cut off before I could come back to this question on the last, on uh, Mr. Taylor, but what level of compensation were you told would be for this position? Because I understood that it would be less than what the current board members are, are making, so I was trying to get clarification on that. Well, I'm certainly not ch chasing his position right. for the salary. Uh, I'm I'm okay like I am. Uh, Bill asked me if I would uh, consider, and I told him, sure. You know, I'd, I'd work for for the tribe. But in uh, in the discussion I had, I understand that uh, they're asking. Uh, I'm going to ask the board to reduce the pay, and uh, I understand that board membership would be 25000 Okay. Thank you so much. So I, I have to go back to the UKB issue because this is a grave concern. Um, I mean, it is a showstopper for me on any candidate or individual in a leadership position for the tribe. Uh, when we voted unanimously last night to preserve our land into trust jurisdiction, for the Cherokee Nation as a council, uh, because it wouldn't be just about the United Couture Band, and it's not just about casinos, it's also about the Shawnees and the Delawares, and I think that uh, one of the councilmen was referring to the Natchez, who are trying to identify themselves now as a nation within our boundaries. So, um, yeah, so, and, and other people, so this is much more, but because of the leadership position, we're, we're at the position of trust we're asking you to take. I think that even in your leadership position as a board member, you would be asked to defend the boundaries, the borders, the nationhood, the very sovereignty of the Cherokee Nation uh, against any outside <coughs> entity. And it's not just about gaming and one fire and however they want to put a package on it and put a bow on it. It's about our tribal sovereignty and nationhood. So I'm, I'm still a little bit concerned about the position you've taken on the UK <coughs> and any other outside tribe, uh, because we're asking you to be a leader on your own, uh, not not just what the chief wants or even what the council wants necessarily, but to give us advice as a, a business person and a leader within the tribal community. So I don't know if you wanted to comment more, given that perspective. Well, I would I I would say this: I, if 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 this body here is voted unanimous to oppose it, then obviously I'm not going to uh, get on a, a soapbox and be a cheerleader for it, okay? But I don't know what 
influence that I could have if I wanted to support it, supposedly. I don't know that I would be in a position to really have any, any influence to counter what this body wanted to do. And I'd be inclined to support this body and the, and the administration. That's a policy decision, and I'd support it. And if the administration supports this board, which I would hope that they do, I would hope that the, the day of fighting and split is over, uh, you'd find me as a, 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 a soldier of the group. Mr. Perry, I appreciate your time and consideration today. Thank you very much okay. for indulging me. Thank you, Madam you Chair. Uh, Ms. Glory Jordan and then Ms. Fishing Hawk. Having, having lived all my life in this area, I'm very aware of Mr. Berry's qualifications. Uh, I've had a number of people from this area <coughs> come forward to visit with me saying that we are getting quite a high caliber, high moral, highly experienced individual in Mr. Berry consenting to be on this board and consenting to uh, uh, do it at a reduced rate from what the previous board has done it at. And I'm excited to see this kind of experience come forward to assist us in the tribe, and I will be supporting Mr. Berry's appointment. Thank you very much. Ms. Fishing Hawk. I'd like to uh, mimic what kind of Glory Jordan said. I'm impressed with any man or woman that goes from being poor to growing something into a $250 million business. I'm a big believer over and over in our boards. I get tired of seeing people over here at the nation that's used to signing the back of a check and not the front of a check. There's a world of difference. And my hats are off to you. I do have one question because it's bothered me for a while. Since you're going to be on the board, how would you feel about the deputy chief, a chief, or a tribal council member receiving contracts from one of our businesses, such as CNB or subcontracts, and doing business with ourselves? Well, I think it ought to be very open, ought to be public, and it shouldn't be hidden if it is not illegal. If it's legal, then it should be very transparent. Okay, thank you. Question has been called, unless there's someone that hasn't spoken. Thornton, did you have a question or comment? Yes. Okay. Fire away. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Berry, <clears throat> my primary question was will be mostly about the about my district and, and the inside the nation. And the one that I uh, asked Mr. Taylor is the same thing I'm going to ask you. What do you think about when you bring in a new business, bringing it into the nation? And bring it into the different districts here in the nation where the economy is so low that we need something to boost our people and our nation. We've got one township in, in my district that's that's over 80% low income. And this is the type of thing that this, what I feel, that this business entity should bring into the nation. And you know, what's your thoughts on that? I'm tired of, I'm, excuse me, I'm, I'm very tired of uh, buying businesses that I don't even know we bought. Another thing is they're outside the nation. They're outside the United States, you know, and they're not helping our people from within to uh, uh, give them a better quality of life. So, you know, I would, I would start to answer your question by the fact that I'm a very aware, aware of that. I grew up in a Indian community up on Honey Creek uh, amongst the O'Fields and the Snails and the Steens, and and uh, we were all in the community very poor. There was no no jobs, and there's still no jobs up in those areas. There's, there's a big poultry plant at Southwest City, Missouri, where it used to be our shopping town. But there's many parts of uh, of uh, the Indian Nation, Cherokee Nation, that could really use jobs. And I have, the last several days, I've been studying about what we could come up with, what we could, what we could develop. And you know, I spent some time talking to Sean uh, in the last few years about business that we might could stimulate in, in conjunction with the tribe. And uh, that, that idea is not totally buried yet, but if anything, should start cooking out of that, I'd have to resign my position and divorce myself from, from this deal. But, you know, there's, 
<clears throat> there's lots of areas of, of the Cherokee Nation that could probably contribute in, in uh, greenhouse and plant production if you had a facility to take that product and distribute it out to a radius of three or four hundred miles. And so we spent some time talking about that and it, it may be something that would come alive again in, a, in, in the future, but if it does, I'll step down and, and pursue that. But I'm, I've racked my brain as to what we could come up with and I'll continue to do so and discuss with the other board members if I'm uh, approved for the board. And I'll be a, a biggest fan that you have to try to come up with some businesses that'll make jobs where the people live instead they have to drive 30, 40 miles to a casino or something. Uh, you know, when I went to school here, the, the whole workforce was Cherokee Indians at uh, Ozark Nursery, and it, as it was at Greenleaf. You know, if you, if you weren't careful, you'd get run over on Highway 100 coming from Stillwell, the Indians going to Greenleaf Nursery. And uh, anymore, most of the Indians are working in the casinos. I still work some Indians. I've got a lot of Indian friends that work for me, but uh, more and more it's becoming less and less. And I, I really hear what you're saying. And I really uh, will spend a lot of time thinking about that and working on that. I appreciate that very much because everyone sitting here thinks that education is the way out for children. Well, it is. A lot of them are have, not going to go to college. You've got to have income because a lot of these kids at the age of 14, 15 years old, they'll quit school and go catch chickens because it helps their family or do something of that nature. And you talk about real high paying jobs, high tech jobs, that doesn't fit what we need in the Cherokee Nation. We've got to have the jobs before we can, can bring these people up to a level where they're educated and they, yeah. they can do what they do. Well anyway, I'll get off of that. But I, I thank you for your answer. But I want this council to know, in 1997, this person here was uh, brought in along with several others, and I was one of them to serve on CNE board. And we served on that board, and uh, it was when the uh, CNE, CNI, uh, those businesses were running in the red. They had paid no dividends to the Cherokee Nation. And through Mr. Barry, as chairman of that board, at, uh, uh, of course, we brought in Sean Slayton, and, and to me, Sean Slayton's the one that started <clears throat> this business outright. And from that day forward, we have come this far. And those first few years was the most important thing that that board had done. And uh, I, I want to thank you for that. And I want you to know that I, I appreciate what you did and the work that you did. And, you know, you made it easy for me sitting on that board because we voted for what we thought was right and it helped the Cherokee Nation. And that, that was great for me. But uh, at the time, the only, the only funding that this council was getting mainly was from the smoke shops. And that was what was paying our salaries. But uh, the discretionary funds, it's, it's remarkable how they've increased. And even over those first four years or something like that, we, you know, we had to turn it back over. But anyway, uh, I wanted everyone to know that this, this gentleman right here was one of the ones that brought CME out of the dungeon to speak. And CNI has never come out of the dungeon. I mean, they've cost us millions of dollars and it was costing us millions of dollars at that time. But that's another situation. But uh, with that, uh, I think this man makes good decisions. I think he makes the best decision for our people. And I'm going to go for him. I'd like to call for the question or second to call for the question. <laughs> you, know, you know, when we went on that board, it was making zero. And, and that's right. three years later, it wasn't making big money, but it was making about $7 million, and uh, that was a long accomplishment. That was mostly bingo at that time. Well, and went smoke shops. I'll say in 99, when I went on the council, uh, we were making quite a, quite a bit of funding. 
I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was several. It was definitely in the black and making money. Yeah, it was in paying dividends. <laughs> All the cigarettes, you know, Mike was working uh, for the uh, uh, CNE at the time, and uh, the, the money I found out was making a 17% markup, but we were making zero. I said, where in the hell is the money going? <laughs> and you know what? We had thieves everywhere, and we, we, we fixed that. Yeah. We fixed it. Anyway, so much for that. Questions been called. All in favor of Mr. Berry's nomination signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Aye. Congratulations, Mr. Berry. Thank you. And thanks for being here. Okay, item three is a nomination confirming uh, is resolution confirming the nomination of Rex Earl Starr as a board member of CMB. I um, we have Mr. Starr. I second it. Okay. Ginger, I didn't hear you. Okay, on behalf of the uh, principal chief's office, it's my pleasure to nominate Rex Earl Starr uh, as a board member of Cherokee Nation Businesses LLC. And Mr. Starr is here today. If you have any questions, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve. I do. Okay, and then second. Okay, Mr. Starr, you want to come forward, please? Thank you. Mr. Baker, did you have your hand up? Yes. Please. I just asked for the same from the amendment okay. as before. Okay. Already said. Okay, thank you. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Starr. You want to say briefly? Briefly? <laughs> and Mr. You know, Starr I mean, is an attorney. That's why I said briefly. <laughs> I've been wondering about the popcorn and the Cokes. I keep waiting and I haven't seen that yet. Um, first of all, it's uh, it's nice to be here this morning. I, I know a number of you, but there's there's some of you that I, that I do not know and haven't had the opportunity to meet. Um, my name is uh, Rex Earl Starr. I'm from Stillwell. Uh, over in over in Adair County, live south of town. Uh, matter of fact, I uh, still live on uh, on my granddad's uh, original allotment there, uh, out around Star Springs. If any of you are familiar with uh, with uh, that area, uh, grew up there. Went to uh, school in uh, Stillwell. Uh, went to high school. Graduated in uh, in '61, which is hard to imagine that far back. But uh, at any rate. Uh, Started out at Northeastern, uh, went over here a, a year and a couple of summers, and then transferred to uh, Stillwater. Uh, went went there. By the way, they're playing good uh, good football this year, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> real, real proud of the Cowboys. Uh, so uh, finished up uh, there. Uh, I got my bachelor's and master's there, and then uh, during that time, I was in the uh, Navy Reserve program. Uh, Transferred over to the Army, went on active duty for four years, um, and uh, this was from 66 uh, to 70. Uh, after I got off active duty, I went to law school at the University of Tulsa. I finished up there and, of course, stayed in the reserves all, all the way through. Uh, came back and started in uh, private practice in Stillwell. I have been there throughout the entire time. I served as an assistant district attorney for um, eight years there, and then uh, served as um, as an assistant United States attorney over in um, uh, Muskogee back in the, in the mid '80s. And then upon uh, leaving that, we went back to Stillwell and have been in private practice uh, ever since. Been involved in farming and running a few cows uh, down through the uh, down through the years. Mom and dad. Uh, of course, had had cattle. We uh, I grew up on a dairy farm. We we had a dairy there uh, during the time I was in during the time I was home in school, and uh, of course, have continued not with the dairy cattle. Got fin finally got rid of those, but uh, with the uh, beef cattle operation, and of course, raised strawberries uh, during uh, during the time there also. So. Uh, uh, basically, been engaged in the uh, in the uh, private practice of law the, the majority of the time. Is that brief enough? That's, you did good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions or comments for Mr. Starr? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Speaker. Uh, good morning, Mr. Starr. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. Um, could you give me a perspective on your business 
acumen and experience and background on number of employees maybe you've managed or size of businesses and those things or has it been kept to just the law practice? It's, it's mainly been, uh, been in private practice of law which uh, uh, has been uh, normally I've, I've had, uh, had a secretary or maybe, maybe two and I said, where's, do, do, I, do I say this, Miss Brown, Ginger, okay. I had, I had the pleasure of having Ginger to work with me for, I mean, every year. Yeah, and then she got smart and left, so, but anyway, <laughs> I, I had the pleasure of having her. But most of my work has been with, uh, with uh, Secretary too, except when I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and of course we had a number. Probably the most number of, of people that I've been involved with had to do with my, with my military service. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, I had uh, I was in a um, a uh, helicopter uh, outfit over there, and had command of a number of individuals. Of course, that's a little bit different, but still overseeing. And then in the in the reserve uh, uh, units that I was in, I had command of a number of people there. So that that was mainly it. Probably fifty or sixty people would be would be the tops, I would think. Okay. Do you have any prior or current business ties to the Cherokee Nation or any of our entities? No ties. I've tried to sue them a few times, and uh, I've sent some letters to Mr. Huffman here, and he always sends them back to say, say he doesn't have any money, but uh, <laughs> but uh, that's been that's been my my extent. Uh, okay, so I'm going so including the past because I've seen documentation otherwise during the Joe Bird administration. So help me understand. I I thought. You were involved in that administration, and I've seen depositions and court documents. Sure. To the I, I'm, I, maybe I misunderstood. I okay. thought you were talking about presently. Uh, no, priors, uh, prior. as well as prior. Or prior. Uh, I served with uh, Chief Bird from about, uh, well, probably about three, three and a half years in his administration. Yes, I did, as a general counsel. As general counsel? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you have any relationships with the United Ketua Band, Shawnee, or Delaware Nations that also have relationships with the Cherokee Nation? No, we had some litigation, I think, with the uh, with the Delawares back uh, again, back what, 10 or 12 years ago, or 12 or 14, however long it's been uh, with, with them. But the with the UKBs, I haven't had any other than stopping by and eating a hamburger down at their casino there. That's, that's about it. So you're not on record as an attorney for them on any case or any situation representing them in the United States? No, no ma'am. <laughs> okay. So, um, also, how do you, um, oh, one last question, so, or there's a couple questions. Have you or your spouse Shot donated, right off, yeah, yes. to any principal uh, chief uh, during this last race, and if, candidate, and if so, how much? Yes, ma'am. Uh, my wife donated to, uh, to Chief Baker 5000 Okay. But you did not? No, I did not. Okay. <coughs> and, um. So if you were asked to do anything illegal or unethical um, by anyone in your role as a CNB board member, how would you respond? Well, it depends on what, what, I, what I felt like it uh, uh, was. I think there's a big difference in, oh, I'm sorry, what you think, say? I think that was a late lawyer answer. You said it depends. <laughs> it's either illegal or unethical, so I'm like, whoa. You know, in, in my, I mean, <laughs> In my way of thinking, illegal is, is whenever you know right off the bat that it is illegal. I mean, it is contrary to law, contrary to, uh, contrary against whatever the, whatever the deal may be. Now, ethics is something, is something different. You may ask, uh, you may ask a chairperson about a, about a legal ethical question and she may give one opinion as to, um, Mr. Hembry over here giving another. And, you know, you get into, you get into things like that. And I'm, I'm not trying to, to evade the question, but, but uh, in my way of thinking, uh, legality and something, whether it's legal or not, uh, sometimes is, is different than On ethics. On face value, if you were asked to do something improper, how would you respond? Nothing doing. Okay. Nothing doing. Run backwards like a roping horse. <laughs> so, um, so are you prepared to fill out all the applications and go through all the licensing processes required and feel like you can pass those things? Yes, ma'am. I've done that before. Uh, on uh, in the army, I had a secret clearance, and uh, I don't think I don't think it was ever elevated to a top secret. But I've been through those drills before. Okay. 
And how much uh, time uh, are you able and willing to <coughs> dedicate to the Cherokee people to the CMB board each week? What, whatever it takes. Okay. I've never had a job yet I could do in 40 hours, and it's just uh, whatever it takes. Okay. And so do you understand the tarot law then? You know, uh, or maybe the philosophy of tarot. I understand the philosophy of it. I, I became tarot certified probably eight or ten years ago, and I've never utilized it. I've just never had time to uh, get involved mm -hmm. with it or anything that I felt that I was interested in doing. But I understand the concept, and I think it's a very, very good program. And my problem with tarot is I don't think the outreach has ever been there. I don't think the people have ever been uh, been told about it and educated about it to really know know how to do it. So the <clears throat> philosophical questions are, how do you feel, how strongly do you feel in poli setting policy and actually to implement preference for contractors and preference for hiring and promoting individual Indian people? Well, I think it needs to be done. I, I, I feel very strongly, uh, very strongly toward that because as has already been discussed here a minute ago, we're talking about talking about uh, jobs and, and getting money and getting money circulating. Uh, you know, it's, it's more about that, I think, than it is the, the, the second level of education. And how do you feel about the UKB and, and other foreign nations landed and trust issues within the Cherokee Nation jurisdictional boundaries? I was afraid you was going to ask me that. I tell you, uh, number one, I think the sovereignty is is very very important, and it, it's it's tantamount to every, every, everything else. I mean, it's it's got to be with the UKB when you when you pose that. Of course, there's so much litigation even going on as we speak with the, with the state court, and I'm not sure what what the, uh, the federal courts are doing now. I think they're out of it, but there's all kind of issues there. But I think we have to do whatever we have to do to, to protect the sovereignty. And look of the it. Cherokee Nation? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Starr. I appreciate Thank your you. time today. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Good Chair. to be here. Uh, Ms. Coates? Yeah. Um, you, um, you mentioned that you were previously general counsel for the for Chief Bird. Yes, ma'am. Uh, between 1995 and 1999 for the entirety of his of his term. What was the? No, not the entirety. I didn't. I didn't come on board until later. I'm not sure when it was, but probably three years or three plus years. At the beginning of his term or towards the end? No, no. It did. Uh, he he had already been in for a while before I before I started. Okay. Yes. Um, what was your involvement in the constitutional crisis that took place under that administration? Well, I'm not sure I would classify it as a constitutional crisis, but uh, but of course there was a lot of a lot of uh, unrest and a lot of dissension during that time, and uh, you know I served. Uh, I'm a soldier, and I tried to serve my commander. And uh, I tried to, to give the best advice based on what the law was and based on what we were faced with that I could. What was your advice to him on the constitutional issues, the impeachment of uh, the Supreme Court justices, the uh, firing of the marshal service, some of these kinds of questions? Well, I think I think some of those <laughs> issues that already had, or the seem like the marshal's issue had already come up, and uh, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, uh, I hadn't thought about that in some time, but um, I think it was just some decisions and some uh, uh, a lot of discussions uh, with with uh, other officials around, and it, it certainly wasn't my uh, my uh, total advice. But Was it your I'm, advice? I'm having I'm having some uh, hard time thinking about everything that went on during that time. It was a complex time. Mm -hmm. Difficult yeah. times, very difficult. Hopefully, hopefully we never mm -hmm. go through anything like that again. We would certainly hope so. Um, were you advising Chief Bird when Chief Bird made the comment that he would decide which of the court of court's orders he would follow? No, I don't. I don't think. I don't. I don't ever recall that statement being made. Now I don't recall that mm -hmm. statement. I do. We've got, um, you've got a number of representative clients uh, here, and I just wondered, uh, I could see that there might at some point be potential conflicts of interest between the business of uh, 
uh, of the Cherokee Nation and some of these clients, what would be your uh, your position if those types of conflicts? Are, are, are you talking? Are you talking about some that I've represented? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, According to your your resume here, you've got representative clients. Uh, Anyone in particular that uh, no, um, you you are a municipal judge in several municipalities around here. You sit on several school boards, um, and I was just wondering if there were uh, conflicts of interest uh, that might potentially come up. What your position would be? I, I wouldn't I wouldn't see any uh, any conflicts. Uh, you mentioned the uh, municipalities. I, I've served as a city judge in Stillwell for a number of years, and then also West Salome. Now, West Salome, we have a number of dealings with the uh, with the casino there, and uh, I've met with the uh, with, with the casino officials and security and uh, the different ones, you know, over the time, trying to uh, trying to work things out. I don't, I, I don't, I would not perceive any problems, but of course, if that developed, well, then uh, I know how to resign, one well, one one job or the other. One yes, or the other. sure. And as far as the schools are concerned, uh, I, I just could not imagine there would be a, a conflict uh, with the schools that I represent. Now, I'm not on any of the boards, school boards, it's just just representation. As their attorney? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. district. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to clarify, it is your statement that you did not have a role in, uh, in um, the... Uh, the actions by Chief Bird uh, in impeaching the Supreme Court justices in those years. Now, when you know when you say when, and I don't even recall the an impeachment of the uh, judges, but uh, when you say role, I, I don't know if I would go that far or not because if I'm if I'm his counsel and it's being talked about and and, and whatever, he may have. He may have done something based upon what I what I recommended or what I said, so I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to separate myself from that because huh? obviously I would have thought that I had some responsibility. Yes, yes you were advising him in those years. Pardon? Yes, as you've acknowledged that you were advising him in those years. I, sure, I, yes, yes, ma'am. I mean, I was in that position. Yes, okay. sure, mm -hmm. sure. Thank you. Yes, yes, ma'am. And all this codes. Yes, it is. Thank Any you. Any other questions, comments? Mm -hmm. Okay. All in favor of this nomination of Mr. Starr to the CMB board signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Aye. aye. Uh, roll call. Yes, is you're in favor of the nomination. Chuck Hoskin Jr. Yes. Tanya Gloria Jordan? Yes. Lee Keener? No. Dick Lay? Yes. Curtis Snell? Yes. David Thornton? Yes. David Walking Stick? Yes. Kara Callan Watts? No. Bill Anglin? No. Jack Baker? Yes. Julia Coates? No. Jody Fishing Hawk? Yes. Meredith Fraley? Yes. Janelle Fulbright? Yes. Don Garvin? Yes. We have 11 yes and 4 no. 11 yes, 4 no. Congratulations, Mr. Starr. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, I, oh, I'm sorry. I'd like my name added as a sponsor from the gentleman from Adair County. And Janelle wants her name added as a sponsor. And I believe Carl Snell did too, as it would be in his district. And who else? Mr. Snell? Yes, please. Got those? Got okay. okay. Item four confirms the nomination of. Uh, Tommy uh, Wright as a board member of Cherokee Nation Business. On behalf of the Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation, it's my pleasure to uh, nominate Ms. Tommy Sue Bradshaw Wright as the board member of the Cherokee Nation Businesses, LLC. Ms. Wright is here if you have any questions of her. I make a motion to confirm. Second. Motion and a second. And Mr. Wright, you can Baker, your little amendment. Yes. <laughs> nice for for new members, please. You accept. Accept. Thank you. Ms. Wright, you want to come forward? Thank you for being here. Thank you all for having me. Um, I was uh, born and raised in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Uh, I went to graduated from Muskogee High School, came to Northeastern State University to go to school, met my husband, and his family started a real estate business. Uh, my mother-in-law became ill. Um, she had breast cancer, 
and I had to quit the university to help run the business. She later passed away. Um, my husband and I bought the business. It was a little two-story room uh, where Cowboy Rose is right now. And we took that business and we moved it to 501 South Muskogee. Um, we, there were two uh, log cabins on that property. We um, donated those to the Cherokee Nation. I believe they're now out at the Cherokee Village. Um, we have grown our business from the little two-room business with, with two employees to a major uh, real estate company. We have three offices in Cherokee County. We have 40 to 50 employees um, and associates. Um, we have done several developments in Cherokee County. We have South Ridge, that is our most recent. Um, we have, uh, we put in Oakwood Housing Edition. We took a medical building and we renovated it and we recently sold it and um, we've had several other business adventures and I believe that my business skills and ability to manage and um, and to come from a uh, family of three with a single mom and to accomplish what I have I can help the Cherokee Nation. Any questions for me? Any questions, Ms. Count? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Yes. Welcome and good morning. Good morning. Um, so I guess you've already answered a number of employees and kind of your business experience and, and those things. So do you have any prior or current business relationships with the Cherokee Nation or any of its entities? I do not. Okay. What about the United Couture Band, uh, Shawnees or Delaware? I do not. Does your husband? No, he does not. Okay, so um, what if there's uh, land purchases, not just for gaming, but for other business diversification or other things? Um, how do you, would you have, I mean, how do you see that as a conflict of interest if the Cherokee Nation asks you to do something or your husband, or one of your realtors versus the United Katua Band, Shawnees, Delawares? Well, my loyalty would always be toward the Cher for the Cherokee Nation, and you know I can't obviously control my husband, but I have a big influence on him. So uh, I believe that you know um, I, I believe that if I were on this board and it was something that I chose to accomplish, that he would stand behind me. Okay, and I, I don't know. We'd have to ask the Attorney General, but I think that you would have to. He would still have to disclose that there were those things going on. Um, or get it cleared. I have one of those husbands, so yeah, he yes. has his own business. Y you mean cleared through the church? That, that it would not be a conflict That it would interest. not be a conflict, yes. Okay, sure. So, um, thank you for your candor on that. Also, um, have you, did you or your spouse donate to any principal chief candidates, and if so, who and how much? We did. Um, I donated 5000 to uh, Bill Baker, and Scott donated close to that. Okay, thank you. Um, if you were asked to do something illegal or unethical by anyone in your role as a CNB board member, how would you respond? I would never do anything unethical. Okay, thank you so much. I just have to ask, we're in positions yes, of yes, trust. Yes, I would so, uh, I think the work we do is a little bit more open, and once we release the board members to go, it doesn't appear as open because we <coughs> conduct doing business, so it's better we ask those questions now. Sure. Um, do you understand the tarot law? I do not understand the tarot law, but I uh, fully, but I am tarot certified, or my company was. I thought that was important, and probably 13 years ago uh, or so, uh, we became tarot certified. So philosophically, how do you feel about preference for contractors and bidding that are tarot certified versus non, and hiring and promotion of individuals within the company? I personally believe that we should lean toward tarot certified companies. Now, what was your second part of that question? The, in hiring of individual Indian people, and especially Cherokee Nation citizens, and then promotion within, that as a board you would set policy for these things. Mm -hmm. So I need an idea of how you feel about where your vote might potentially mm -hmm. land on actual policy. I believe Every Indian preference. Yes, I, would, I believe I would lean toward an Indian preference. Okay, thank you. Yes. So also, um, do you, how do you feel about the UKB land into trust issues? 
I'm not familiar with that, and I would have to probably leave that to the attorneys or to, but um, I'm never in favor, I mean, I do not like competition, so I always would think that we would need to, you know, take care of, of, of ourselves first. Okay. And how much time are, do you have available every week uh, and are willing to spend on the Cherokee people through the board? Uh, I can devote as much time as needed. Okay. And you're familiar with they've given you a list of the licenses mm -hmm. and the applications required and you feel comfortable that you can complete all those and pass? I actually have my packet all filled out except for Excellent. just my financials and um, a few and getting my income tax returns together. Okay, and how would you, how do you imagine, because I assume you've thought about what are your strategies for diversifying business and, and those kind of things. Um, what, um, what are some of the ideas you have for the... And again, I wasn't aware that I was uh, in this position, so I've tried to research, except for just about a week and a half ago, so I've tried to research as much as I can in a week and a half. But um, I'm all for the Chief's mission in growing the Cherokee Nation. I'm for, um, I believe that I will look at the business plan as if it were my own money and try to, you know, try to make sure that it's spent where the most amount of profit will come back into the Cherokee Nation and to the Cherokee people. So how do you feel about the dividend and how we diversify and strengthen the Cherokee Nation versus money, balancing money kept at the, with the businesses versus going directly into services. And again, I, I need to, I need to look at that more thoroughly to be able to answer that. I, maybe I'll ask, so do you believe in long-term sustainability or short-term gains? I mean, like how much do you pay yourself back maybe in your own business as a general rule? to sort of make sure that the business survives. Yes, uh, um, I can tell you how I did my own business. I give myself a pro small percentage to live on and the rest of it I put into the bank. And that way the next month if I don't have any, if I don't have a sale, I still have money to live on. So, you know, I, I believe that we have to, I don't believe you can spend more than you're making. And um, I believe you have to, um, I, I believe you have to, look for investments. Uh, I think my expertise in real estate will be an asset um, and I think you have to look for investments and for um, for dividends that will turn over. And just I know yes. um, Mary Ellen Meredith was actually our first female to serve on our business boards mm -hmm. that I know of so you might reach out to her I for will. advice on how to keep the men in line. I will. Thank you Ms. I Wright. Will. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? All in favor of this nomination, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Sorry I was so nervous. Thank you, Ms. Wright. <laughs> You're fine. Okay, item five is a nomination of, of Mike Watkins, Michael Watkins as a member of the Cherokee Nation Business Board. <clears throat> On behalf of the Principal Chief, uh, it's my pleasure to nominate Mr. Mike Watkins, Michael S. Watkins, um, as a board member of the Cherokee Nation Businesses LLC, and he is here to answer any questions for you. Mr. Watkins, I have a motion to confirm. I have a second. Second. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Item number six is the nomination of Mr. Frederick. Do you accept the premium amendment? Mm -hmm. Ms. Jordan, do you accept uh, Mr. Baker's amendment? Yes. Mr. Lay? It's okay. not even newer than the last one. Right? Okay. Good afternoon, Madam Good Chair. Afternoon. Council, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. It's an honor and a privilege to serve. I'm a Cherokee citizen. I'm a sixth generation Cherokee citizen in Cherokee County. I'm married to my wife of uh, 44 years, coming up Friday. He's also Cherokee. Uh, I grew up in the Tahlequah area uh, all my life, all 12 years in this education system. Went to Northeastern for three and a half years. Uh, left to go in the military early. I always thought I'd get back, but I never did <clears throat> at that point. Uh, got into business when I got back out and I came back home. I've been in the business, uh, finance, uh, for 42 years. Uh, just retired this last year. 
Uh, we're the CEO, uh, Vice President of Operations, Interim CEO for uh, Pat David Stewart's job for a couple of months with C&E. Uh, it wasn't C&E when I first started with the Cherokee Nation being the outpost. We had, uh, didn't have electronic gaming at all. All we had was the uh, pull tabs and manual bingo. It was an exciting time to go through that, uh, to go into the electronic gaming. And, uh, going through the gaming compacts, work with those, work with the uh, tobacco tax, going through the smoke shops, the fuel tax, had quite a bit of experience. Uh, was on there with two different CEOs. For some reason, I wound up <clears throat> delivering most of the uh, messages to the council. For some reason, they didn't want to attend very much. It was usually turned over to me, which I'm sure Sean <clears throat> can relate. And David Stewart. I've worked with Sean uh, and David Stewart, both. Uh, I would love to serve on this, on this board. I feel like I'm qualified. Any questions? Any questions? Ms. Cowboys. Thank you. Mr. Wright, good morning, I guess. Are we still on morning? I don't know. Or Watkins. Close to it. Thank you. Uh, so. I definitely believe in Tyro. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. 100%. Um, and Cherokee preference. And any preference. Okay. To what degree? To can what you, degree? Maybe can you illustrate maybe some of the policy ideas that you would have? Well, I feel like if the right qualifications are there on it, it should be Cherokee preference. Secondary would be Indian preference, on it, then go to the outside. I've always heard a chief from the Choctaw Nation speak once, and he said that the way he looked at any kind of businesses uh, that came into his area, or at that time, or the tribe, was to try to keep the dollars circulating within the tribe as much as you can. I believe that that also goes to our people and to the tribe itself and to our businesses. Um, we need to continue to look at that and see how many times we can keep the dollar circulating for us uh, within our tribe. Okay. Does that help? Um, yes, thank you. So, um, do you have any prior or current business relationships with the Cherokee Nation or any of our entities? So only if you're CNE. Okay. I had a gaming license that's um, for six years. Have you sued the Cherokee Nation in the past or any of our entities? Yes. Okay, can you please tell me more about that? It was a wage dispute after I left CNE. Oh, is it personal? My contract. It's oh, a personal, personal issue. Contract. It's not. That's all. Okay. So, uh, what about with the United Katua Band, Shawnees, or Delaware Tribe of Indians? I believe in defending the sovereign nation of the Cherokee citizens. Okay. And, and so, do you have any? You, do you have any business care. relationships, or have no. had any business relationships with them? No, absolutely not. Okay. And you've answered my land mm -hmm. and trust you sovereignty bet. issues. Very good. Um, Very much. Do you? How much time? Um, are you willing to and able to commit every week? I'm retired uh, now uh, from Mr. Barry's company. <clears throat> worked with him several years and served with him on the board. Sorry, I actually worked under him on the board. But, uh, whatever it takes, you know, get the job done. So 80 hours a week, you're not afraid? No way. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask him to set Actually, you put in 60, 70 hours a week. <laughs> <laughs> now, that wouldn't bother me at all. I'm, I'm just proud to serve. Does, does that, that prior relationship or any existing relationships with Mr. Barry potentially create a conflict of interest between maybe a vote or no. would he be able to act independently? No, no. Uh, I'll be able to act independently. I think Definitely. he's still here to hear that. Right? Yep, we're in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and he knows. Uh, and he's a diehard Republican, I'm a diehard Democrat, so we do have differences. Okay, very good. Uh, you got to have balance, Absolutely. so checks and balances. And you've seen the list of licenses and the paperwork involved, and you're willing and able to fill that out and feel like you'll... Well, certainly, I'm about halfway through. Okay. Um, have you donate you or your spouse donated to any principal chief candidate in this past race? And if so, who and how much? You donated uh, $200 to Bill Becker's team. Okay. That's all. And your spouse did not? No. Yeah. Okay. Or I assume, I forgot, I didn't read... I don't think you have the personal information, so I don't mean to... If you didn't, mm -hmm. so. Um, also, what about where do you see the businesses going? What's your vi personal vision for where we're headed in order to grow I'll, the revenue? I look forward to uh, it's to expanding our businesses. Uh, I feel like gaming is always going to be part of our revenue. It will be from now on. Uh, fuel tax, the compacts, tobacco, always will be. But we certainly need to diversify and get into other areas. 
Uh, worked in the travel plazas in the past, helped build the convenience stores, put those in. Uh, we looked at the theme park down in David's area on there at one time. I think those are great. Uh, they all need the feasibilities need to be done to them. You know, we need to expand and get into those areas and hire more people, more for Cherokees. Okay. Do you have any other maybe new opportunities that you think we might potentially go into or? Well, I threw a pitch to uh, Joe Bird and to Chief Smith for ice cream. For ice cream. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, it's a well-known fact in economic downturns and receptions, there's two things that increase, and that's alcoholism and ice cream. Very interesting. And I would uh, pitch to both of them that we should get into a franchise with Baskin Robbins, or we try Brahms, they, didn't, they won't do it, uh, or some other ice cream vendor. But I believe we can put some people to work in the, you know, I've never seen anybody pulled over for eating too much ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> How do you, thank you. How do you feel about dividend and investment and reinvestment and long-term sustainability or short-term and balancing the demands, I guess, on our dollar? I believe that we'll have to discuss that with the board and with, with the council. I think I'll see what, I need to see what programs are there now. Uh, I, I serve on, I've served on the water board here locally. I served on the, I served now on the hospital board where we've, uh, the hospital was almost broke when I first got on it. We had to make it a, a hard determination to sell it, you know, lease it, or borrow some money. And we borrowed about $20 million to increase it, expand it uh, to what it is today. We have one of the first joint ventures, Cherokee Nation, which is uh, some Cherokee Nation Health Partners. That's, uh, I think, the first one of the first Cherokee Nation LLC companies, the corporation that's been developed. Uh, <clears throat> I was on the water board. Uh, Chief Smith, I worked with him after I left CNE to get a CDBG grant for 750000 which we expand the water line to Moody for 80 tribal members and to uh, Lowry School. One that more, answer? Yes, thank you. One more question. Mm -hmm. Since you've had the unique opportunity of actually serving as CEO, not just as a board member, as Mr. Barry had, just a couple months. I, yeah, even as a couple <laughs> well, of months. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about our Hard Rock branding and the marketing purchase that Katu said? I'd really like to see where the contracts are, what we have set up. Uh, we <clears throat> appear to be doing very well otherwise, but uh, again, I'd have to look at it and look at, do it my own study, see how it works out. Okay. Thank you so much for your time and consideration of well, those questions. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Coach? Yes. Mr. Watkins, you mm -hmm. served with the CNA board again under Chief Bird's administration. Mm -hmm. Is and, that and Chief Smith. And Chief Smith as mm -hmm. well. Um, <clears throat> to what extent did um, Chief Bird direct the actions of the businesses and, and how did you respond? Uh, hmm. uh, I never really had re that much reaction with him as far as CNA business itself. Usually the board was set up independently and that's who I reported to. And you're not aware of, of no. interactions between Chief Bird and the board, or what kind of directions? That well, he, he may have with the board. I, w I wasn't on the board. You you were simply I was with an officer. You mm -hmm. were an officer. Right. Okay. And you did not have direct interactions with Chief Bird, or take direct uh, uh, advice from Chief Bird, or orders, or anything like that. No. So you had no it, response. It would be, no interactions. Uh, no if, if I do, I don't recall. Uh, but I reported directly to the board. Then. Thank you. I just have one question. Um, diversification income now is about 39 percent. Right. Practically, uh, what do you, what your goal would be, uh, in income-wise from diversification? What do you consider would be a practical level? I would like a percentage. Walmart kind of considers McLean Wholesale as a wholly owned company of Walmart, and they like to see 51 percent. You know, done outside of that. I don't think we could achieve that, mm -hmm. but I, I would certainly like to see that improve. One of the things we learned when we opened the convenience stores is we don't need to be stepping on fellow Cherokees' businesses at that time, so it's something we really need, really need to watch, as you well know. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to put one locus. <clears throat> uh, that's, I feel like we can increase that number uh, somewhere between uh, there and 40, 50, if that's what we can. Any other questions, comments? 
All in favor of this nomination, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. No. Thank you. Look forward to it. Thank you. Item six yes, is. Can we take a five minute break, restroom yeah. break? Sure. Yes. We'll take a five minute break, be back here at. Let's make it 11 10. <laughs> Chief, uh, it's my pleasure to nominate uh, Lacey A. Horn as treasurer for the Cherokee Nation pursuant to Article 7, Section 4 of the Constitution of the Cherokee Nation. I'd like to make a motion. Uh, you made a motion on the second. Okay, second. I'm second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Now, uh, Ms. Horn, you want to come forward? Thank you for being here today. You want to briefly tell us about yourself? Thank you, first of all, for having me here today. This is a true honor um, for me to be able to have an opportunity to come back and use my skills and abilities for the good of the nation. Um, I seek the council's favor in my nomination and I, and I hope to answer all of your questions as, as honestly as possible. Um, I am a Cherokee. I live in Bayan, Oklahoma. I am a certified public accountant. I study finance and accounting at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. From there, I went on to work with uh, KPMG in Chicago. And for those of you who don't know, KPMG is a, uh, is a big four firm. And uh, it's, it's along the likes of uh, Deloitte and Touche, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, Ernst & Young, and then there's KPMG. Um, it's one of the largest professional services firms in the world. And there I received an unbelievable amount of training. I worked very long hours overseeing the audit engagements of multi-billion dollar companies and learned a lot. I learned a lot of best practices and got a real feel for how a successful organization is run. So that's me. <laughs> Mr. Baker? Yes. Have you had any experience in governmental accounting? Okay. My experience in governmental accounting is, um, well, first of all, GAAP is the same for, for all entities in the United States. It, the, of course, there are some nuances for, for governmental, of course. Um, and then the financial recording, reporting requirements are under GASB 34, which I'm familiar with. Um, then, um, Let's see, I, I'm undergoing training for it. And Ms. Catcher has graciously agreed to stay on and, and help with my transition. And I have one more, because I, I knew this was a question you were gonna ask. And then I'm also familiar with the provisions of Title 62 and uh, the Constitution. So, yes. Okay, but no actual governmental account. Did you audit any? Governmental entities? No governmental entities. I do have experience with nonprofits, so which I believe you have an accounting background that has some trade offs with governmental. Okay. okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Ms. Campbell. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, just so that all minds are clear. Uh, and thank you, Lacey, for taking on such a challenge and being in front of us in such a public position of trust. Yes. So, um, on a, do you have any prior or current business relationship with the Cherokee Nation or any of its entities? No. And so, do you have any relationship uh, with the United Katua Band, Shoshones, or Delaware Tribe of Indians? No. Does your husband? No. Okay. Does, um, and how would you respond if you were asked to do something illegal or unethical? I wouldn't do it. Very good. And so, if, um, did you or your spouse donate to any of the principal chief candidates? And if so, how much? Yes. And uh, to who? To Chief Baker and a modest donation of $650. Okay, thank you. And I think in your position, um, I can't remember how many 
employees that mm -hmm. Cali manages actually. Um, can you uh, give me an idea of your management philosophy because that's a critical department for us. Well, uh, I do. I do know it is a, a bigger department um, in the range of 40 to 50 employees. I, I might be wrong, but that's what I've been told. Um, I, uh, I've, I've managed engagements and I have had excellent upward feedback from my staff. I've, I've managed staff of all levels. And my philosophy would be when I first get there, I want to meet with all the financial resources group individually and in small groups and find out who these people are and find out what they do and, and how they serve an integral part in the resources group. And then from that, you know, you know, figuring out, you know, what works and, and, and finding out, you know, like I said, the best practices of the group. And um, I, I, I am very confident in my management skills. Okay. To give me an example and maybe illustrate that, could you tell me how you approach uh, employee evaluations? Can you describe that for us? Very honestly. I am, I've, I've also been the recipient of employee evaluations and I've written many, many employee evaluations. And um, I, from, from a personal standpoint where I have benefited and grown, is for that senior manager to be honest with me and, and you know, to, to obviously, you know, state where my strengths are and then and state areas for growth. So from a, from, from a performance-based uh, from a performance evaluation standpoint, um, I feel like I can I can definitely give very constructive, formal, and informal feedback. Okay. How often would you give formal and informal evaluations? And is that feedback one way or otherwise? In what direction would that be? Okay. As far as the uh, frequency of it, I think annual is a is a good standard policy. That way, you know, everybody is is having it on a timely basis. Um, and as far as the rest of your question, could you? So do you give 360 evaluations and you allow people to give feedback to you or do you only give feedback to the employees or does everybody give feedback and then you merge those at the time of evaluation? Well, we probably figure out some way to do it on a rotating basis, you know, where, um, you know, where upward feedback is, you know, every other year for, you know, certain people, you know, so that way it's, it's, it's not a whole barrage of um, evaluations being done, you know, in a single year, you know, you kind of um, can stagger those out. That's okay. how I would approach it. So, so formally, you would give evaluations once a year, uh, but because this is not just a position of trust, and, and you've got your CPA license and all that other stuff, but you've also got this large group of employees you're going to manage. So, um, how often would you give informal feedback then to those employees? I think whenever it is warranted. I mean, I feel like if people are doing their job, I'm not going to look over their shoulder and micromanage them. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it's, yeah, I think whenever it's warranted. Okay. So um, tarot is actually a large part of your group's mission, the tarot compliance. Mm -hmm. So are you familiar with the tarot law? Somewhat, yes. Okay. Well, the law, I'm not sure. I'm familiar with the tarot program. Okay. How do you feel philosophically about uh, vendor contracts and preference and then also hiring and promotion of charities? I know you're a Cherokee Nation citizen, so that's well, I, I agree that the, uh, or I believe that the uh, Cherokee dollar is circular. So, you know, when the Cherokee Nation, you know, gets money, is, is funded, and then we take that money and use it to support, you know, our tarot certified, you know, Indian-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're not only helping ourselves, we're, we're helping the nation. So, um, you know, I, I, I definitely support Tara. I, I think it's, you know, a wonderful program. Okay. Now, how do you, um, I, I assume, because, I mean, we're here, so mm -hmm. I assume you have the answer to this. What is your philosophy on what the cash reserve should be, uh, as well as, I mean, well, there's there's a the cash reserve and there's mm -hmm. other types of there's contingency dollars and mm -hmm. all these. So, if we were if it was your ideal Cherokee Nation budget, where would that be at, and why? Where would the cash reserve be at? Okay, um, let me let me try to because I want to I want to answer this as as accurately as possible. Um, I mean. It, 
Help me out here. There's a legislative act that was passed in 2002 that requires us to have 1.75% of the total budget. Okay. Uh, which I believe is ten and a half million dollars today. Yes. We do not have that today. We have 1.25 million in a cash reserve off the top of my head. Um, and then there's, I think, five million line of credit, which it was later amended to allow five million dollar line of credit. And there's three million in contingency. And our two week payroll period is approximately five million dollars. Mm -hmm. That's I've, a little I've, bit thin. Okay, so yeah. where would that be at for you, I guess? First of all, we're not in compliance, so I would need a plan on how we're going to get into compliance, and then what should that look like? Well, obviously, we have to be at a, at a point where we can cover payroll. I mean, you know, employees have to be paid, and um, you know, I would I would like to ensure that that is sufficiently covered for sure. And then, as far as um, other expenses go, you know, I'm I'm willing to look at and and work with anybody on any, any other additional needs that they feel is, is not going to be covered by a contingency fund. And to give you an idea, like a snowstorm, mm -hmm. which I think the persimmons are showing spoons, so we're going to have it again on snowmageddon, <laughs> is a million dollars a snowstorm, I think, is okay. probably a good I ballpark back of the envelope figure. So um, I, I guess we're looking for the leadership from your role mm -hmm. on what, if you were to give us advice, what do we set that at? All, you know, what do we need in the bank in order to make sure that the risk to the Cherokee Nation and our people is minimal okay. or minimized, I guess? Okay. Um, if I had all the budget materials here, I would, I could do maybe some back of the envelope calculations for you, but that's, that's, that's something I really need to evaluate. I mean, that's a serious issue. Could you, you know, and also, uh, we didn't have a chance to talk before this, so do, do you have, could you offer maybe a possible direction to us at when we go to full council. Absolutely. Okay. Very good. Thank you. You're very welcome. Much. And I know you're very passionate about the Cherokee Nation and the pres preservation of our jurisdiction and our sovereign rights as a nation and especially our water rights. And I appreciate the leadership you've shown in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Horn. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Keener. Hi, Miss Horn. Glad Hi. you're here today. Thank you. Good to see. You. Um, I didn't, I mean, you may have said this, and I may have missed it. Uh, why you left KPMG after four years? That's a simple reason. Okay. I wanted to be home. I uh, I wanted to be close to my family. I got a nine-year-old grandma that lives across the street, and uh, I missed it. Okay, that's fair enough. And then, how many pay periods were you thinking about uh, covering for a contingency mm -hmm. reserve that was ever needed? Let's say we suddenly didn't have any funds, but we did have a contingency reserve. What would you like to see uh, as far as the pay periods being covered? I mean, absolutely, the pay period in the very near future. I mean, that one for sure, you know. Um, okay. You know, hopefully, I don't know. I'm, I'm a conservative individual, so I would say, you know, at least that one, and hopefully another one. Okay, so one or two. I don't know if that's the right answer or not, but I'm, I'm, I'm just... Well, that, that's fine. I don't think there is a right answer, but I want your opinion on that. Thank you, Ms. Horn. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Thornton? Yes. <clears throat> I can't sit here and be quiet because I've, I've known this lady since she was a child. Uh, the thing about this lady is uh, she's very bright and very intelligent. And she gets that from her family, I believe. It's been handed down to genes. So uh, she was an awful good student at my end. I think she went on to OU, didn't she? SMU. Yeah. And uh, you can't hold that against her now, Don. Because, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she's, she's also uh, an environmentalist because she fought very hard and worked very hard for us and got buy in uh, on the injection well that was trying to go in down there. And uh, I really appreciate that. She's <clears throat> but anyway, uh, I've known her, uh, her father. I've watched him grow up. Uh, her grandfather. Uh, I was close friends with this. Their family and my family go back to the 1800s. And uh, we've always got along. 
uh, her grandfather and my father, of course, uh, they always competed when they were out. You know, they run races and race home, and race back to school, and, and they boxed, and fought. But, you know, that's the way friends are. That's that's what you do. And anyway, uh, uh, her grandfather, I knew him. I knew her grand, I know her grandmother very well. Uh, and even on the other side, uh, uh, I know I knew her great grandmother. And uh, I knew her great-grandmother on her father's side. So uh, she was quite a lady. Uh, that was back at the time when, when people gathered around in the evenings and, and they sat around in the shade and they gossiped. And I know there was at least six or seven to ten women would, would come into the house and, and they'd sit out and gossip. And we don't have that type of... of Comrade Robertson anymore, you know, and and it was kind of funny because when you get that many people there, Lacey and uh, Mrs. Horn, she wouldn't leave because the first one that left, that's who they talked about. So, you know, that's the top of it. Uh, uh, but I want to tell you, this lady's very honest. As far as I know, I've never known ever. I've been in any kind of trouble or, or given any kind of trouble at school. She was a good cheerleader. She, she was a very good cheerleader. So I, uh, I'm, uh, you know, happy to to uh, support her. Uh, I want to tell her that uh, this council, you know, we we as a whole, uh, you're taking a, a person's place that uh, we like. Uh, Miss Kelly Ketcher done us an excellent job, and you've got a lot of work to do, Mary. and it's not going to be easy. You know, uh, you you're going to have to work uh, uh, very hard. You're going to have to get tough in this job and say no sometimes. <laughs> but uh, I want to tell you that I appreciate you, and uh, I'm glad that the uh, chief brought you forward and nominated you, of course, uh, by Ann Wolverine. So thank you very much. Ms. Fulbright, yes, thank you. I want to congratulate you on your appointment, and I must say also that I've known her family for a very long time, and her mother is my, uh, like, personal physician, although she's a nurse <laughs> practitioner who saved my life, not recently, and uh, I'm very appreciative of that, and um, I, I know she'll do an excellent job, and our families go back a long way. She mentioned her 90-year-old grandmother. Well, uh, a couple of years ago, my father-in-law was 91 when he passed away, and your grandmother wrote us the nicest letter. How they grew up when they rode horses to school down at Seven Oaks, and she comes from a long line of Cherokees, and I know she'll do a great job. And I just want to say, uh, with your acceptance, which I'm sure you're going to get here, we say welcome to board, and I know you'll do a great job. Thank you. Right. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Call from Questions been called. I just have one question. Yes. Uh, the job description for treasurer. Yes, ma'am. You, you have seen that in the Constitution. No, the, the actual job description. No. Okay. Oh, in fact, go ahead. Pardon me. I'd like to hand the question calling over here to Mr. David Watkins. I'd like to call the question. <laughs> 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 All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Aye. 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 Jim. Roll call. Yes, as you support the nomination. Okay. Julia Coates? No. Jody Fishinghoff? Yes. Mary Fraley? No. Janelle Fulbright? Yes. Don Garvin? Yes. Chuck Coskin Jr. Yes. Tina Gloria Jordan. Yes. Lee Keener. No. Dick Lay. Yes. Curtis Snell. Yes. David Thornton. Yes. David Walking Stick. Yes. Kara Callen Watts. Yes. Bill England. Yes. Jack Baker. No. We have 11 yes and 4 no. 11 yes, 4 no. Nomination is confirmed. Congratulations, Ms. Horn. Okay, last nomination is um, 
Nomination of Shannon Buell as Marshal for the Cherokee Nation. On behalf of the Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation, it's my pleasure to nominate Shannon Buell as Marshal pursuant to Article 7, Section 14 of the Constitution of the Cherokee Nation. Mr. Buell is here to answer any questions. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Mr. Buell, you want to come forward? Thanks for being here. Thank you, ma'am. He's out protecting us now. <laughs> There's, we have a lot of marshals out there. Okay. I first want to say thank you for being here in front of you today. And if there's any questions, I would uh, please address to me at any time whether I'm marshal or not. Uh, the marshal service is always uh, supportive of the council, always supportive of the due process of the law. Uh, so no matter how it turns out, we will always be here to support uh, the laws of the Cherokee Nation. A little history of myself. My name is Shannon Buell. I was born and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I went to East Central High School. And quite frankly, the only part in my early life where I knew I was Cherokee was my mother would pass all these hospitals, take me to Claremore when I got hurt. I never understood that until I was older. I am a uh, veteran. Uh, I became a marshal about 11 years ago, 11 years and about four months. I started out in patrol, I just as a, a new patrol officer, did not know uh, much about law enforcement. Uh, my FTO, however, was uh, a man by the name of Frankie Greffelwater. Uh, I, I hope that he trained me right. I think he did. Uh, he did a service to me and my family. I've uh, risen to the rank of assistant special agent in charge of our operations and I currently report directly to Sharon Wright, which is the current director of the Marshal Service. Any questions? Ms. Cowan-Watts, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Marshal Buell. So, um, do you have any uh, prior or current business relationship with the Cherokee Nation or any other entity? Other than I'm an employee. Okay, and what about the United Katua Band, Shawnee, or Not other tribal bands? Not at all, Okay. And uh, on the UKB issue, could you, from your point of view, if you are marshal of the Cherokee Nation, if land is put into trust by a foreign tribe within the Cherokee Nation jurisdictions, what problems would that uh, exhibit for you as a marshal and your marshals? Well, let me address that in two ways. Uh, one, the marshal services, in my belief, main priority is the sovereignty of the Cherokee Nation, uh, not the sovereignty of other tribes. Uh, so it would not behoove me to, to want that. Uh, secondly, our, our second priority should be the protection of civil liberties and the protection of civil rights within our tribe and, and outside our tribe. So I do believe that it would pose problems with jurisdictional issues within the 14 counties that we serve. Okay, so on um, the tarot law, could you tell me, I know we've had recent issues with whether or not tarot law was complied with on some martial service contracts. So how, how, do, you, how do you feel about tarot and, and how would you implement it as maybe a policy? Whether, <coughs> you know, how, how far would you take tarot compliance in hiring, promotions, and then vendor contracts? I do think tarot uh, specifically addresses vendor contracts and the purchasing of equipment and supplies. And we have always tried to, to support Tarot. I personally believe that we should uh, purchase from our Cherokee members, first and foremost. And if we cannot, then we should look elsewhere. Uh, on the same line of reasoning, I believe we should always employ tribal members first. And then if we cannot, then look elsewhere. We should go tribal members first, then other Native Americans second, and then if we cannot find those qualified people, then to look elsewhere. But I believe we can always find qualified Cherokees uh, for positions that we have within the market. Have you read the Cherokee Nation Constitution and the Cherokee Nation Marshall Act? Yes, I have. Okay. So in your view uh, in how you conduct yourself in your daily line of business, um, who do you answer to? It is my belief, honestly, we answer to the people of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, that position and the Attorney General's position should be separated from uh, all branches of government, whether it be the executive branch or the, the council or the judicial branch. Uh, I think that the tribe uh, had good reason why they separated those two entities. And we should always take counsel with the other entities that we, that we uh, as, a, as a tribal nation have. But we should stand alone and say, this is what I believe is a due process of law. This is what I believe is the right thing to do. We should always have that. So if in your... Uh 
during the conduct of business or during the what is happening if the, the principal chief, the deputy chief, or any council person, or even a justice calls upon a marshal because maybe they're standing there or they can't reach you for some reason, uh, what is the process for how that marshal is supposed to respond given the organizational chart in the the constitutional duties of the, of the marshal, okay. which that's right. you're being nominated for. Yes. Uh, we will always, whether it's the marshal, the, the appointed nominated marshal, or a person that we just hire, uh, we will always follow the laws that, that you all create as a body, as a, as a council body, and that the justices uh, then determine how is that implemented. But we will always follow the, the law. Uh, we will uh, never take favor. Uh, we will uh, handle whether it's a case against you, ma'am, or, or anyone on the council or the executive branch. Uh, we have to look at that case on its merits of the case, not of who is involved. And if we continue <coughs> in that path, I think we'll be successful, no matter what happens as a, as a tribal nation. But if I start taking a political side or a political promotion side, uh, then I think that is a road that, that, for one, the Marshal Service has never in my, in my opinion, uh, went down and we should continue that and not go down that road. And, and, and I appreciate that response, that perspective. I think I didn't word my question well. So from a management perspective, you are the high marshal. You're accountable for that, the yes. conduct. If we're standing there, there is anything that happens. Uh, recently, uh, when the new chief was sworn in, there was a marshal, I guess, that escorted them into and if they don't were they supposed to tell the high marshal what was going on how how quickly would you expect them to be alerted at what point and then whether or not marshals were appropriately in the pod later the next day those kind of things from a management perspective in your constitutional role to protect the Cherokee people what is supposed to happen there right. on at what point do they contact the marshal and say we're doing this we believe it's within the confines of the law, but we're informing you because it's your responsibility. I do believe that uh, marshals should inform uh, the marshal. The same being they should inform administration if it is an administration issue. Uh, however, I do not want people to come and talk to me, uh, whether it be council, whether it be the FBI, whether it be ATF, whatever entity, or one of my marshals, if they, uh, if it affects uh, maybe the case that they might be working or or could impugn their integrity on it. So I would never, you know, I, I cannot foresee the future. The FBI might come and ask me questions, and if, I, if they ask me questions about the chief of the Cherokee Nation or a council member, uh, I'm obligated to, to at least keep it quiet until that investigation is over and do that due process. So uh, I would never expect a marshal, unless they are asked to do something illegal or unethical or immoral, uh, to address it directly with me immediately. I would hope that I would find out okay. uh, through that chain of command. Uh, we are kind of a uh, paramilitary organization. Uh, we have a very structured chain of command that we, uh, that we respond to. So I would hope that they would use that. And that chain of command goes both ways. Okay, and I, have th I think I have three more questions. So okay. there's the recent report and there's findings. So you're prepared to go forward with fully documenting all the policies that are required uh, not just for daily operations, but how we keep evidence, um, the criteria that our marshals are supposed to meet, physical fitness, I think was one of the issues. Yes. Um, you're ready to fully engage all of that that's required, because that's a lot yes. of work from what I can tell. There is. Uh, when I was nominated, it wasn't like I was jumping up and down excited about it. I am motivated about it, <laughs> but, but we as marshals know the work ahead of us. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, Sharon Wright started this work uh, several months ago and has been highly motivated to get these things resolved. These are issues that most of the time we self-identify. Um, so it is going to be a, a long process, a, a hard process, but I do believe that we should have one standard at the Marshal Service. Whether I'm a newly a sworn in Marshal at 20 years old or I'm the director, we should have one standard. Uh, whether it be evidence, how we collect it, how we process it, and how we store it. Whether it be the physical fitness that we have. Whether it be the background investigations that we do. Everything that we do at the marshal service should be one standard. So when you as, as a council or the community call a marshal out there, they get the very best that the tribe has.
So yes, I do believe we should. Okay. Um, is there anything you would change about the current relationship that the marshal service has for contract and marshal service at the the casinos? The, the armed to, officers or the actual six marshals that, or five marshals that we have assigned there? I, I still, uh, I haven't expressed it publicly, but I have concerns about potential conflicts of interest with the way things are done currently um, and, and the setup. I mean, I guess, let me ask it this way. How would you ensure that we have integrity in the process of the marshal's involvement for law and order at the casino operations and any business operations? I think whether it be the casinos or uh, we do have an officer with uh, uh, the Attorney General's office, we have an officer with Child Support Services. I think that any money that's exchanged should not be, if I'm the marshal out there in the casino, I shouldn't think I'm getting all my salary from that entity. That entity should be between entity to entity exchange of money. Let's mm -hmm. say if the CNE is wanting to fund or, or marshals, whatever number that may be. And that should come into our budget. And then we supply marshals just like we normally would on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I think where we get into trouble is uh, they start taking ownership of I'm there and I'm actually working for CNE and that is not that has never been the case. It's never been the case of, of any marshal that I've, I've served, but there's that, that look that it might be. So I think you take care of that and get rid of that, that indication that I work for CNE. That, that okay. should never happen. Thank you. And then one last question. I've always struggled with where we're at on our marshal budget. Um, I think any government, yeah, any government, um, I believe government's about basic infrastructure, and one of those is our law enforcement capacity. Um, but we're also a government, and I mean, there's, we can't grow too big or we're not sustainable. Um, what are some of the things that you're going to look for in the budget on how we're going to possibly strengthen the marshal service? And you guys do a great job. I'm not saying that I, I don't know about this good to great, because I think there's a lot of great things about the Cherokee Nation already. So. But how can we maybe be more efficient or expand? Because we, we struggle with so many issues we don't talk about publicly, just like last night's meth you know, cartel issues. You guys are covering those, and we don't talk about that. So how, how can you, what are some budget uh, issues? You one might? thing that we've really turned a corner on is actually going out and, and hunting grants actively. Uh, we're looking at that other option. Because we do know that the purse strings of the tribe are tight. Uh, we, we understand that. We try to get by with what we have, like every other department that the, the nation does. Uh, but there's other areas that we should explore, grants, uh, c and &E, some of the businesses, uh, coming to you all and, and saying, hey, here's what we have, these are the numbers that we're presenting, and uh, see if there's other ways to get that funding than what we have been in the past years. I want to just publicly thank you and Marshall Wright and all the officers that serve. Uh, you do some incredible amount of work all the time that you know, some of it we, we just will never be able to disclose publicly what actually you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure our sovereignty and make sure that everybody's safe within our boundaries. So thank you and your the team and Marshall Wright for all the work that she's done. Uh, but I appreciate you even considering this. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Mr. Keener. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, Marshal Buell, I was going to ask you what your, maybe some of your new initiatives would be, and you've had time to think about that. And I know you did answer some of those uh, during the course of the questioning, but if you want to... Oh, what, one of the big things I want to kind of promote is um, our hiring. You know, right now we have, uh, quite frankly, a very low standard to, to become a Marshal. I want to raise that standard. I want to promote uh, education. Uh, I, I never had the, the normal college experience. I, I never got to be a frat or got to do those things. I was in the military and being deployed, and it took me, quite frankly, seven years to get a bachelor's degree because I was always deployed. Uh, as a marshal, I went ahead and got a master's degree, went full-time uh, at NSU, uh, worked all day and went to school all night, didn't really have a life for two years. I, I foresee those educational requirements being put into the marshal service because not only does it affect the professionalism of the, the agency, but it expands that individual officer's ability to 
to, to look out, to, to say, do I, do I truly want to be a marshal in 10 years or 15 years? Or do I want to get into environmental management? Do I want to get into something else? It allows those individual <coughs> marshals that opportunity to expand. So uh, I think uh, implementing an education requirement will be something I will seriously look at if I am uh, going. Have you given any consideration for the encroachment of our trust lands? You know, there's, I guess, hundreds of cases about that. Um, and I know that you're not staffed for that, but uh, have you looked or thought about how you would approach that? I, I don't really understand the question. Well, like the like the Kenwood, where all the uh, um, rights of way are taking a road going through, or it's not supposed to be there, or a fence that's not supposed to be there because it is trust land. Or uh, I, I understand there's hundreds of cases. Right oh, okay. Now, now so. I understand the question. Oh, uh, we're we're enforcers of the laws. Uh, it, uh, it is it is the due process of the courts to establish any summons or subpoenas or warrants or or writs of assistance. And we as the Marshal Service have always uh, been over backwards as soon as we get that document. Uh, we will actively go out, uh, whether it's a land-based issue or any other issue. Uh, I also believe we can go one step further. I believe if you're an individual landowner and you have these approaches, issues, we should have officers there to, to be able to guide you in the direction that you need to do to get some resolution. And we cannot give that resolution as a Marshal. But we should, in our vehicles, have those documents saying, hey, this is who you can speak to the tribe about helping your case. I do believe we do that with victims uh, in, uh, in many crimes now, and we can definitely do it for those appropriate issues. And some of the people out in the community don't have the resources or even who to call, those numbers to even reach to uh, decide, can I do something? Is there something we can do? Uh, so that might be an, an avenue uh, that the marshals would do to, hey, I can't help you. I don't know this, but here's the people who do. So I do believe that is a, a very good, a good point. To do. How about reaching out to the communities for uh, across the whole Fulton County area? Uh, we we have an issue just with Manning. Uh, uh, we have uh, districts in uh, District One, which is anything north of 412. It does take out a small portion of uh, Mays County. Uh, we have District 2, which is uh, south of 412 to about Stillwell, uh, Highway 51, pretty much. Then we have District 3, and then we have District 4, the casino. Uh, but it is it is a uh, a process of, of manpower. Uh, we have the flood rates anywhere between 20 and about 35 marshals. Uh, as as uh, the councilwoman spoke to, you have five assigned to the casino. We have one assigned to child protection. We have one assigned to the courts that reduces those numbers down. So that's one of the things we would like to look at. Uh, we'd love our North Marshals to go north uh, and, and see some of those communities that don't get the, the Marshall organization like uh, Kenwood or Cherry Tree or Bell or, or some of the areas that are closer to us. Thank you. And, and speaking for myself on council, I will do everything I can to support that branch or uh, Marshall Service. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lay. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. How are you doing, sir? Uh, you say we have marshals in casinos, and do you pay those out of your budget, or are you reimbursed, or share, or is sharing reimbursed for that? Or what? Uh, I believe that we are reimbursed for the part of it. We have contract with CNE. Yeah. Uh, uh, so they, they do come out of our budget, but they are it's on a different budget line item. They are supervised by the marshal. Uh, they are supervised by us. They're not supervised by CNE. So how, how many do we have like that? I believe five. Yes, five. As far as, as uh, well, I knew we had marshals in the casinos, and I didn't know how that worked. I far prefer to see them in our communities. Uh, and I, possibly you would too. I don't know. What, I what are your feelings about that? I do agree with you. Uh, CNE has a, a large security force. Uh, 
Uh, they have two, pretty much, I, I don't want to speak on CNE security force, I'm going to say that the armed officers, the, the security officers that have firearms in the casinos are classified as reserve marshals. Uh, they, uh, they have to, by, by tribal law, to be able to carry that gun in there. They're paid by CNE, they're managed by CNE. However, the, the marshal controls those uh, reserve commissions. Uh, so, so we do have a hand in it by those reserve commissions. How many marshals do we have? Total? Or what are you supposed to be staffed at, I guess? I think our staff is at 35, is what our number should be. 30, but we're at 33 right now. 33. Yeah, yeah, these marshals in casinos, I think that, I don't know, what, how did that policy start or who, who's responsible for that policy? Well, uh, I don't know who started the policy, quite frankly. Uh, we do have a high call volume in the casinos, especially, especially Hard Rock Casino. So, I, I don't know who started that. Okay, thank you. And uh, the, when you mentioned the paramilitary aspects of your, you meant just the structure of the hierarchy. You didn't yes, mean sir. we have an army. No, we okay. do not have an army. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, Mr. Mike. Thank you. Any other questions? You want to talk? talk yes, ma'am. Talk for the question? Talk for the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor of this nomination, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Shannon. <laughs> Okay, that takes care of items one through seven. So we may back up to old business. And item one is uh, travel council travel expense policy. Ms. Calmont. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move for approval for the uh, one listed in the book with the amendments that were passed last time, right? Before it was tabled. Uh, there's one, there's two different copies here. The second copy. Neither of those are mine. Um, so, as the, the agenda one item, the one in the book is what I move for approval. Okay, so second. I have a second. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, now, Ms. Jordan. I would offer as a friendly amendment the second copy that was given out, specifically paragraph four, which has been changed and uh, in addition to paragraph 13. And it's outlined in the second copy that was received by the council earlier. It changes to paragraph four and paragraph 13. Friendly and amendment? Yes. Sam Watts? I'm sorry, I'm looking for the number two. I thought I had it right in front of me. Could yeah, you read that to me? Laura Jordan is talking about it. It has second copy written on the front page. Okay, so this is that in addition to the reimbursement authorized by law, that Council of Chirkinay shall be entitled to a travel allowance in lieu of mileage in the amount of $700 per month. And this vehicle allowance is allow tribal council members to attend meetings and protect tribal business within the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation. Then the four at-large counselors within 40 miles one way of their home. And we may not, ch tribal counselors may choose not to take said travel allowance and charge for miles driven at a rate applicable to the Cherokee Nation employees. And that's, that is that section is what we were asking yes that is consistent with county government and state government public officials um, the feedback i've gotten from my constituents is they want to know that we're out and they want to know where we're going and what's going on so i i won't accept it as a friendly amendment even though i appreciate what you're trying to do i would put that in the form of a motion then second, second. Any discussion on um, Ms. Laura Jordan's motion? Yes, Mr. Andrews. Is uh, your motion to uh, move the entire second copy as an amendment? No, oh, only number four. Um, only, okay, only as to the changes to number four. Everything else is identical yeah. to the one in the book except paragraph four and, and, 13. and the one. Uh, the uh, red amount on 13, which adds a uh, NCAI and the travel at large group meetings as official meetings. Point of order. Sure. So, is the motion just the section on the $700 a month allowance for in-district travel, or is it also for yeah. 
the NCAA to include as standard travel, not part of the $7,500, the NCAI and at-large group meetings. It is four and the red uh, delineation in section 13. So it's, it's the red in four and the red in 13. Correct. Well, it'll also include, Meredith, that blue where it says within the boundaries okay. of tricky action. It's the whole part four and the red in section 13. Everyone clear. Thank you, Ms. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I can I can quantify quickly the seven hundred dollars a month for in district elective or in district travel, but I cannot get my arms around what that budget looks like for including the NCAI travel and at large meetings as official travel because that's the way I understand it. Do we have? Uh, I assume the good councilwoman from Cherokee County has an estimate. What will this do to our budget and can we accommodate it? And how much is that estimate? It will depend on the number of people. Sure, go ahead. It will depend on the number of people that choose the first alternative of taking the set amount versus a mileage amount. It would appear from looking at our budget that this is well within our budgetary means. I'm asking to I guess the ends may I to the NCAI travel and the at-large community meetings in addition as because it's above and beyond the $7,500 set which I know we are doing today and are comfortable with this could be a considerable amount of money is what I'm asking so I, I believe if it were to become a budgetary problem that our speaker would enlighten us at that point because I'm, I'm seeing that you pull us off at that point so I'm, I'm not in fear that we're going to exceed our budget at this time okay thank you thank you madam I speaker may, Doug, have you consulted with or have you talked with her no. about this no i haven't <coughs> no i haven't but we we currently pay travel to ncai and we currently pay mileage so what form you choose to take whether it's allowance or direct reimbursement really is not going to have an impact as we currently take mileage what's that budget um, I believe it's five hundred on five hundred dollars or five hundred per counselor on each budget. So okay. we may have we may have more than enough budget. So okay. we'll just take a look and see what options are chosen. Well, um, uh, Mr. Before we finish, Miss Jordan. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Mr. Anglin. Tiny, can I ask you a question on this? Yes. Uh, the seven hundred dollars is that in lieu of, of collecting mileage to mm -hmm. like Cherokee, North Carolina, or do you still well, get that? That would be considered a trip that would come under. Uh, it's actually a uh, joint council is considered an official trip under Section Thirteen already. I guess I'm still not clear on it because, like David and I, we don't fly, so we drive. I think you all have already worked that out. Uh, I was informed by Mr. Thornton that that had already, and I would <coughs> defer to Mr. Thornton on that because I understood that had already been worked out. Yes, uh, I, I just made a trip to California and I didn't have any problems and everything worked out just fine. So I don't have any problem, you know, with it as far as that's concerned. This doesn't have anything to do that $700, but going outside the Cherokee Nation, but it does have to do with everything going inside the Cherokee Nation. If you make a trip to, to Catoosa or you make a trip to Bonita or even down here or wherever you go inside the nation, it, it isn't a district travel. Uh, Actually, number four would not, Mr. Thornton, I guess number four would not address his question because it would be outside the district. Yeah, it would be outside. Yeah. Anything outside, you can claim mileage on the way I read this. Mm -hmm. If you go to Oklahoma City or you go to Durant or anywhere of that nature, you know, you claim mileage on You can either, or you can take the mileage of $700 flat rate, or you can turn in your mileage every month or every two months or whatever what we have to turn it in. 
I've never, you know, we've always carried it if we wanted to. But either or, it's it's harder to keep up with the mileage and turn it in than it is just take flat rate. So I don't know which what I'll do. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I just don't know. But I've thought about it. You know? I support this. I support it for all of the council people. Some of you will take a flat rate. Some of you won't. Some of you will go over the seven hundred dollars. So you won't be you won't be taking a flat rate. And you know I appreciate you. Uh, I think it will cover you. You know if you do go over, there's not an, an, an amount that you can go that, that I can see on it. I, I know we have some that do and some that don't. So. It's just up to you in the bridge. Thank you. Uh, oh, excuse me, Dad. I might add a little bit more directly build to your question. Uh, any trip that you take that takes you out of the 14 counties for an overnight stay would fall, like you were mentioning, to North Carolina, that would fall under our travel budgets. Um, this is, a, is specifically the mileage that we're talking about for travel within the 14 counties. Okay? So anytime you leave the district and you stay all night, it's all travel. It's a separate budget than the mileage, so it'd be covered under a, under the travel budget. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think I understand it now. I just want to make sure it wasn't an and or. Uh, Miss Coates, yes. Um, I had Jack and I were at community meetings in the Southwest last weekend, and this question actually came up in Phoenix of people saying, "Why don't?" Some of the other councilor meter uh, members visit us, and so I think that um, that that's desired by the people at large, and certainly that's what I've always been about is to try and build the bridges of understanding. But um, I'm wondering if what's good for the goose isn't also good for the gander, because uh, we've got um, five districts and a number of community meetings that take place within the boundary as well. Uh, and if we're going to compensate counselors to travel to some within district to at large meetings, can it not also go the other way, where at large counselors can be compensated for attending uh, community meetings within the district as well? Because that's, you know, that's the other direction of, of, of building the bridge. And uh, I would just uh, ask the council lady if uh, she'd be amenable to that kind of a. Uh, the way it's written, it includes everybody. Well, to travel to at-large group meetings, what I'm saying is where... No, well, you are included in number four, too. I mean, you can make a... No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. Not for... Uh, what I'm saying is that there's a counselor who lives outside the boundary. What you're suggesting is the counselors who are resident inside the boundary can travel outside to go to at-large meetings, and that's out of a separate budget. What about the other direction, is what I'm saying. That would only seem to be fair to me that... The counselors who are resident outside the boundary can also travel within, uh, have a, 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 an additional budget to be able to do that, uh, to to go to, to community meetings within districts uh, within the boundaries as well. Because that's uh, that's what you're suggesting is that this should only be allowed to go in one direction. And I'm saying the fairness of it to me would seem that it be able to go in both directions. Well. Uh, Julia, if you've got a amendment you want made, then put it on the table. Um, I believe it's it's written very well. We uh, Todd and I worked on this along with getting input from a number number of other counselors. Uh, if you have a suggestion, then put it out there. I'm not saying I'll Mr. accept it, but I'd like to see what your suggestion do you, is. Do you understand what I'm saying? That I, this is just going in one direction, and I'm, I think it's just that it probably wasn't considered. Yeah, in, in, the, in the, uh, the situation, and, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, we'll, we'll use real life examples here, okay? Uh, and be mindful that the travel policy is, is, is reviewed every year, okay? So we can work in real life situations. Here in the situation, we have two at large counselors. One, uh, Ms. Coates lives in Tahlequah. She lives in district. So she, you know, that, that would include her to go into any of the dish community meetings within the district. Let's say you had one in, uh, in, in um, Locust Grove. You, that, that would be uh, covered. Mr. Baker lives in Oklahoma City. Now, uh, uh, what Ms. Coates wants is that it's, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Now, you have Mr. Baker who lives in Oklahoma City. 
should it not be fair for Mr. Uh, 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 Baker to be uh, 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 to be allowed to the, the same reimbursement uh, opportunities to go from Oklahoma City to Greasy, Oklahoma, for community meeting? Is that that's that's the situation, correct? Um, so, so therefore, you know, and, and that's a that's a workable situation in which you know when we're looking in real life situations. Now, sometime during the future, if we have an at-large counselor from Seattle, now that might be a, a horse of a different color. And we, but again, we review this policy on a yearly basis. So, uh, uh, does that uh, is, is that the situation that's that you're, asking? That's yeah, what you're asking. I, I, I mean, it just seems that it would be equitable. Clarification. Yeah, could we direct this? Uh, we have a point of clarification. It, yeah, I wonder if the councilwoman's looking at because okay. I, I do. I think I follow her, and I think she's talking about paragraph thirteen, yeah. where it says, or it's a I travel or travel to at large group meetings. So it's limiting, and then it says at large group meetings, where it, it might say community meetings. Mm -hmm. And if it said community meetings, I wonder if that'd be the fix. Mm -hmm. I think I just want to make sure that that's the section she's talking about. It is the section I'm talking about, and I think that that might uh, that might reconcile it if the at large was actually taken out. So it wasn't it wasn't exclusive to only at large meetings. Mm -hmm. Are you making that as? A I'll friendly? make that as a friendly. Mm -hmm. Doesn't cause me any heartburn that I see. And if perhaps community could be substituted for group, so that it's sort of more. Well, I had already, already struck sort of at large group and put just community. Community. That's in place. perfect. That's yeah, <laughs> great. Thank you. <laughs> I will finish I the second from conversation. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. <clears throat> All right. We got it clear. I, I frankly thought she was still talking about four, and I couldn't see how four was excluding them, so. Okay. Ms. Cowan Watch. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So if this amendment passed, I want to make sure that my mind's clear on how this impacts the budget. So you, an individual council member has the option to record actual mileage at the federal mileage rate to be reimbursed for in-district or out of district for themselves, mileage for official travel to Cherokee Nation. So that, that what this would do is in lieu of in-district mileage recording, you would have $700 per month, like a vehicle allowance that would be taxable unless you also still record your individual mileage to show that you've actually taken up to 700 or more worth of mileage at the federal rate for your personal taxes. And then we would retain the $7,500 elective travel every year for choices we make on conferences we attend. And now if this passes, none of the National Congress of American Indian trips nor any of the uh, community groups that might be require overnight travel, they would be included in that $7,500. So we would have that plus these additional trips we could take. Is that correct? Plus the at-large would still have the additional 7500 over that to travel to their community meetings. Yes. May I? That's, that's just, just to clarify, I don't think that the way that amendment works, that wouldn't even apply because they can go do as much as they want and need but I with respect to that. But I didn't touch that part of it because I felt that was there. Okay. All right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, we have food out here and some of the people need to eat for health reasons so uh no i'm serious so we need to take about a 30 minute break and because we need to finish everything today can we call for question on the amendment we go ahead and call for the question all right no, I have a question. okay mr thornton has a question mr baker and then we'll take a recess because one person is getting sick I'm serious. One, yeah. one question is that uh, can we, uh, anything that's left over in our travel? It's still covered it's under still the covered same paragraph. In the same paragraph where we can use it for community organization? It, yes, that goes to uh, paragraph 14. Okay. That wasn't, that's, that's, uh, that was as Kira has it written in her, her uh, the one that's in the book. 
all, Mr. Thornton. Yes. Mr. Baker. Yes, I'm not sure how it relates to me living in Oklahoma City. Does the 700 cover all my travel to Tahlequah and back, or just the travel within the 40 miles? Mm -hmm. And do I get the way it's written, Jack? I think it would cover all your travel, so you might not be interested in this. So that means that my living outside the nation, that I'm penalized. No, you can take e well. You can take either option. Right. Yeah. If the option's not advantageous to you, you might want to take the second option. Okay. This gives you this gives everyone two options, yeah. but you're only going to take one. Yeah. Okay. Just want to be clear on that. <laughs> Okay. Any other questions before we voting vote? On the amendment. On the amendment. That's correct. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Aye. aye. Roll call. Yes, it's you're in favor of the amendment. Dick Lake? Yes. Curtis Snell? Yes. David Thornton? Yes. David Walking Stick? Yes. Kara Cowan Watts? No. Bill Anglin? No. Jack Baker? No. Julia Coates? No. Jody Fishing Hawk? Yes. Meredith Fraley? No. Janelle Fulbright? Yes. Don Garvin? No. Chuck Hoskin Jr.? Yes. Tyna Gloria Jordan? Yes. Lee Keener? No. Eight yes and seven no. Eight yes, seven no, motion to carry. Just, just a point of clarification. When we talk about the uh, travel policy, it, it is only in our committee, right? It doesn't have to go on anywhere else. No, it's, it's not. Uh, I, I, I was okay. unsure of that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Can, can, call can we take about a 30 minute recess because. Oh, okay. Good I, well, thank you, Madam okay. Speaker. Yeah. Opposed, same sign. Aye. 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 Roll call. Okay. Yes, since you're in oh. favor of, of the uh, travel policy as amended. David Thornton? Yes. David Walking Stick? Yes. Kara Callan Watts? Bill England? No. Jack Baker? No. Julia Coates? No. Jody Fishing Hop? Yes. Meredith Spraley? No. Janelle Fulbright? Yes. Don Gardman? No. Chuck Costin Jr.? Yes. Tyna Gloria Jordan? Yes. Lee Keener? No. Dick Lay? Yes. Curtis Snell? Yes. Madam Secretary? Yes. Supporting Secretary? No. From Kara Callan Watts. We have eight yes and seven no. Eight yes, seven no. Uh, the policy as amended uh, passes. Okay, item two under old business is an amendment uh, requiring tribal council consent for litigation and settlement of such litigation. Ms. Calwan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I believe our Attorney General, Ms. Diane Hammonds, is still here. Um, she has raised some issues. I would like to better understand those issues as one of the not an attorney in the room. And then also, uh, I'd like to go into depth about a recent example so I can better understand because I think that myself and the Cherokee people want to understand how we can make this work. So, thanks for being here and for waiting so long. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. 
Um, my concerns with the uh, proposed act are basically my concerns with LA 0701, which it amends. Um, that act predates our new constitution and predates the creation of the Office of the Attorney General. Um, the, under the statutory duties of the Attorney General, um, the Attorney General is tasked with representing the nation in all litigation. The conduct of litigation is reserved to the Attorney General. That's a specific quote. And then there's also a specific section in the Attorney General Act that imposes a duty upon the Attorney General to settle any case or controversy on behalf of, of the nation, except that a settlement involving injunctive relief which substantially impacts the operation or programs of a nation agency or would impose obligations requiring the expenditure of funds in excess of unallocated, unencumbered monies in the agency's appropriations or beyond the current fiscal year shall be reviewed prior to its finalization by the Principal Chief and the Tribal Council. The purpose of the review is to determine the budgetary, programmatic, and operations impact of the proposed settlement. <coughs> and, you know, we've had cases before, um, for example, in Cherokee Nation versus O'Leary, um, that construed the Tribal Council's duties regarding litigation after the 2006, um, after the 2003 Constitution and after the creation of the Office of the Attorney General. And in that case, it was found that um, certain tribal council members had violated the separation of powers doctrine and committed ultra-virus acts. So I think um, it would be my advice to you to be very hesitant to impose upon yourselves litigation duties which have been specified out in the Constitution and in your prior statute regarding the duties of the Attorney General. Um, I know what this act is about, and you know, I, I think that we should be candid in talking about it. Um, on September 20th, four days before our election, I was with a number of you and the acting <coughs> principal chief and a number of other people from the nation at a hearing in the District of Columbia where the plaintiffs in the Van case, the defendants in the Nash case, had sought um, to stay our election so that we wouldn't have the election four days later, had sought an interruption of our government-to-government -government relationship with the United States of America, and a cessation of all funding. There had been discussions with the attorneys on the other side prior to that, and of course I can't go into any of that in detail, but some of those discussions did not involve me. Um, so, of course, they, they wouldn't have been binding, but as those of you know who were there, we actually had the hearing, had arguments on the motion, and when the judge took recess, we then uh, renewed discussions with the other side. We arrived at the terms of an agreed order to present to the judge for the temporary relief which was sought, which allowed our election to continue, no interruption of the government-to-government -government relationship no cessation of federal funding. And then later on, of course, um, housing and urban development, which had seized federal funding, reinstituted it. Nine days after that, I appeared in front of this body and I asked you, any of you, if you had any questions about that temporary order, about what had happened, and none of you did. Um, if you will allow me the luxury of commenting on what may be one of my last times before this body, I would appreciate it. You have the floor. It is my duty to provide the best legal advice to the Cherokee Nation that I can. It is my duty, regardless of who is principal chief and who is running for principal chief. I did the very best I could for Chad Smith. I did the very best I could for Joe Crittenden. And I would do the best I can for Bill John Baker. I have lost friends. I have had years-long relationships interrupted because of the campaign propaganda that occurred because of the best effort I could give in that representation. And that's fine. And that's, that's part of doing the job. If you have questions of me, I'll answer them. But I firmly believe, I firmly believe that we got the very best we could get in that situation at that time 
I think that the judge would have come back with something much more onerous than that. We know that he dismissed the case later, but I, I still firmly believe that we would not have gotten the terms that we got had we not agreed to the order. That is not a final settlement. That is agreeing to the terms of a temporary order. So even if this act had been in effect, in my interpretation, I still would have done the same thing. That wasn't the settlement. It wasn't a settlement of a case. It was agreeing to the terms of a temporary order. And I will happily answer any of your questions regarding what I did at that hearing. Ms. Camelot, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I greatly appreciate your candor because I think that for us to work through this all together, we're going to have to have this discussion. And I know I'm still trying to learn what all the terms are, and maybe I need a better lesson in civics with regards to how this actually works. Because I was under the impression that item 16 on here would have prevented this without some concurrence from the council. And then there was also the confusion whether acting chief at the time, Joe Crittenden, had made the agreement or if it was the decision of the AG. Then there was the Friday, the day before the election, the additional intervention by the Department of Interior and Department of Justice and the acceptance of that. And I felt powerless. Uh, I think the Cherokee people felt powerless. That doesn't. I'd like to get some facts out on the table, a better understanding of what all these things mean. Um, is, is there an opportunity, you know, can we, can we clear the air on what maybe could have, should have, had of, might not have? Um, and then also, I think there are people who want reassurance, whoever's in the Attorney General's office and whoever's in the Chief's office, for example, just on the Freedman litigation alone that's left in the Northern District. I mean, I, I don't know how to start peeling back the onion to better understand so that at the end of the day, the, the act in front of us, that we can vote it up or down or decide to do it in a different manner or that it can't be done at all. But I think this is an opportunity, and I appreciate the candor, that we can figure out what did or didn't happen under the Cherokee laws as they exist today and then is there a way to even remedy it? Should we have to remedy it? How do the Cherokee people, after they voted a constitutional question in place, have protections? Does that make any, I'm, I, I don't know, I'm all, I know I'm all over the place, so I'm trying to figure out. But maybe I know, one question at a time. Okay, so maybe can we, may we deal first with the historical part of the recent uh, Department of Interior Department of Justice intervention in our elections the week before. I did not understand under this law, and I later found out that the AG Act, I thought, would have prevented anyone settling on behalf without concurrence. From I didn't the settle anything. I agreed to, I agreed to the terms of temporary order. What specifically do you want her to respond in regard to this legislation? I'm okay, not quite clear. So I, I would have thought, and maybe that's the key, so because the way I looked at it was people are concerned that going forward, what happened the week before the election could happen again without checks and balances. Um, not because the AG, you know, if, if you're doing the job, but it, the perception was, was that the chief's office had settled that too. So there's a mix of stuff. So if maybe if we could clear the air of what actually happened and then maybe some scenario playing on the Nash case in the Northern District on whether or not that could be settled without some concurrence or uh, checks and balances from the legislative branch since that impact the tribe significantly. So are you asking for an example? Yes. All right. Can you Thank give you. her one example? <laughs> If you're clear as to what she's wanting. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I don't, I don't know that I am clear. I mean, remember that the nation is a party, or was a party in the District mm -hmm. of Columbia. The nation. Not just the chief, but the nation. So we were bound by what happened there. So we had a hearing for relief that the plaintiffs were seeking against us, the Freedmen plaintiffs, with the cooperation and in conjunction with the United States of America. They were all against us. We're all clear on that. 
I was there. Acting Chief Crittenden was there. You were there. Speaker was there. There were a number of people there. We all talked about it. We agreed to the terms because we thought it was absolutely the best that we could do. That's what happens in litigation. It wasn't any backroom deal. It happened in a court. We wrote down everything and the judge accepted it. What happened later was we didn't fully comply with what we said we were going to do because it was awfully tough according to the timelines. I was talking to the election commission all during that time. What can we do? How can we do it? The United States and the Freedmen again, the Friday before the Saturday election, set up a phone hearing with Judge Kennedy, basically a show cause hearing against us, although no one said that. No one said contempt, but that's what it was. And they were seeking more relief. And again, we were fighting we might not have an election. We have a, a multi-hour hearing, telephone hearing, in front of Judge Kennedy. We arrived at what we arrived at. Again, we did the very best representation that we could. I did. So as that applies to... Well, I just want to make sure some, some so things that applies are... to this... I don't think that this act, if it had been passed, would have applied at all. Okay. Just point of view, for the record, though, I, at least I was sitting in the courtroom and knew nothing about weeks of negotiation that had went on, and I understood the AG did not know about weeks of uh, negotiations with the freedmen that had been going on apparently with parts of the Cherokee Nation. That's still unclear. Um, and then I would only be able to, I did not agree to anything, and there, was, there would have had to been a vote of this body for me to agree or disagree. Neither did you say anything. Yeah, I did. I didn't say it to you. You were like out in the hall busy and doing all those other things. So, but I was talking to Deputy Chief. Of course, well, I mean, just leave that to me. But anyway, I wasn't wasn't asked either. But it wouldn't have been appropriate because we were part of a body of seventeen that would have been had to have voted on it. I would think in a public forum. So, and that and that's what's lacking. I think for the Cherokee people is that. But if, if I hadn't been there, I also wouldn't have known that uh, apparently the acting chief at the time had been in negotiations for weeks with the freedmen unbeknownst to anybody either. So I was glad I was there for that part. But anyway, I digress. So on this, um, you're saying that even in that situation, this act would not apply. But what about so. in the settlement of the possible Freedman Act or the Freedman litigation that's in the Northern District, would that, if there was a settlement offered in your office, uh, decided to accept it, would that have, because that would be your office that would settle it, correct? We would As have to. Attorney General. And then, if, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So, if the, um, then there was a settlement, it would have to be your office. It would be under the existing AG's Act already required to come to this body for concurrence. Correct. Okay. And we have we have our Supreme Court um, order regarding filing the foreign order. We have the vote of the people. I am bound by the law. May, may I continue? So um, I have two more questions. So. Based on your email, though, and your analysis, this act probably needs to go away in codification anyway because it doesn't comply with the 2003 Constitution. And if there's any parts of it, we should roll it up into the AG's Act if so, it would be appropriate. I think so. Okay. And there are, I mean, any time we have anything <coughs> involving real estate or substantial assets of the nation, obviously we bring those to you. I, I'm thinking of a recent example, the Stall Cup litigation, where um, for the first time ever, we obtained an acknowledgement that we had rights to the old railroad easements from Indian Territory. That was a big deal for us. It may not be monetarily a big deal, but it's a big deal um, precedentially, I believe, for our, our assertions in that regard. But to do that, we also um, quit claimed a portion of the surface interest. That had to come through council. There are many, many things that have to come through council, but in order to be an effective litigator at a settlement conference or at a hearing, I can't say 
I'll get back to you, Judge, in 45 days. I just can't do it. There are times when you have to answer right there. I, will, I, I speak to this body every month. I try to keep you as apprised as I can. I think that there are things that, before they are finalized, should have this body's approval. But not this, not as proposed. Okay, but now, I'm sorry, I've got to continue. So the, on, if that's, because we're talking about like the intent of this act, and now I'm hearing there's this different. So you're even saying that maybe section 16 of the existing Attorney General's Act about concerning settlement of litigation may be problematic or I didn't impractical? Say that. I didn't say that. I said that there are things involving um, substantial assets of the nation that we do bring before council and we should bring before council. Real estate, things exceeding a certain monetary value. So, you know, perhaps we do, but I don't know what act I'm talking about, Todd, do you? The Attorney General's Act? No. Oh. Anything involving real estate, substantial assets of the nation? Oh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, is that from litigation? Is that from LA 701? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I think that, um, I think that the intent of that is good. I, I don't think that it's, I don't think that it's constitutionally valid as it's written. And there are some things that you just cannot practically wait 45 or 60 days before you agree. You just can't. I mean, appoint an attorney general in whom you have confidence that will do the right thing. So on the, because I'm, I'm trying to, when, when my constituents ask, I'm unclear how to um, describe to them what that process was be. And I, you know, the, the top question on there is how are we to, defending their right on citizenship in the Friedman case. So now it's gone. I have fought 12 years. I understand that. I'm not saying that. spent millions of dollars. I'm talking about your office. defending the Friedman case. Which you may or may not be there at the point when, I don't know, right? No one knows what the future. So as an attorney general, I can speak to them as what the, under our constitution, the role of each person, the responsibilities, and I'm unfamiliar with courtrooms. So you go, so it's, it's been dismissed from D.C., it goes to this northern district. If your office then, again, is asked to settle it, you, again, I just want to make sure my mind's clear, that we would have to approve that if there was a settlement, for example, on that Friedman litigation. I don't know how you could settle the Friedman litigation. Um, you know, if you had a final resolution from something on something that large, involving a constitutional amendment of the people, I don't know how you can settle it absent some other affirmative acts by the people or you know, with a final resolution by the court. I just don't. I would love to know, but I don't know how to, you know, absent fighting that uh, another 12 years, I don't know how it can be resolved. Can you tell me one more question? Okay, one. All right. So if somehow there was a settlement from the AG's office um, and it wasn't approved uh, by the Cherokee Council or, or, what it, or even if it, it was, um, how does the Cherokee people have the, if they rise up on that issue? You have the right of removal. Cherokee people have the right of removal. No, but like how do they rectify it so if the federal courts then say they'll only honor that and there's their internal checks and balances didn't work or If the or federal something. courts ultimately rule against us and we're a party, we're bound, regardless of the people's intent. I'm only talking, I agree, but I'm only talking about the settlement part. If there was a settlement without, but you're saying there couldn't be even under that structure, we're, that case. We're, we're bound by the law. I, 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 I don't know how to answer a hypothetical that I don't know the terms of. Okay, fair enough. Thank you You're so welcome. much. Thank you, Ms. Cowdenbots. Uh, Ms. Fishing Hawk. All I have to say is, Diane, you had my attention when you come in here and said, let's be candid and call it what it is. Thank you very much. For You're that. very welcome. Mr. Hoskin. Oh, well, thank you, ma'am. Speaker, I'll be brief. Is it fair to say that had you been in court and faced with the prospect, well, they had filed for an injunction, and said, Judge, uh, i got to have 45 days to go through the council. There would have been an injunction, and it would have been quicker than 45 days. The difference is you wouldn't have been at the table because you would have been powerless to be at the table. Absolutely. Thank you. And I, oh, 
I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. So that's fine. I mean, I've been in that scenario before. Years ago, we had the Department of Labor seeking multi-millions dollars from us in damages, and we had a hearing, um, a multi-day hearing. I did have settlement authority, and we settled that for pennies on the dollar, but when we're sitting there in the midst of it with the arbitrator, I can't say, I don't know if we can agree to pennies on the dollar. I'll get back to you in 60 days. I just can't. It's ineffective. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ray. Thank you. Ms. Hammonds, on, on this act as you see it, do you think that, that it, is, it would be in conflict with our present constitution? I do. Okay. Also, as you, as I look over some of your writings here, uh, I see, you know, this language which says you, you have, you hold the right to settle. I do. And I wonder, do you think that when this was written, perhaps we didn't have these issues that we're coming up on now about sovereignty and the Freedman case and land and trust by other tribes and some of this other stuff that I, I sort of understand where people are coming from to leave that in one person's hand is, is, uh, is uh, probably not what I would want. Uh, Part of the Constitution says the principal chief speaks for the tribe, not the attorney general. So we're in conflict there already. No. Uh, so I, the do you general. believe that we should just stop right here and resolve this whole issue with, with one good comprehensive piece of legislation? I think that we can. I think it's complex, but I think that it, we can incorporate some of those things into the existing AG Act. But as a matter of fact, sir, those issues were pending when this le legislation was drafted. The Friedman case, the Van case, has been pending since 2003, and of course you had the Riggs and Allen case prior to that. Um, you know, and the United Ketua Band has been seeking land and trust against us for a number of years. It, it, the Attorney General is not. Well, it's not an OLC. All, all, the only thing the Attorney General can do is is tasked with the conduct of the litigation. I don't make policy. But you would be making policy if you agreed to some of these issues that are being brought forward. That, that's my point. I, I, I understand yeah. your point, and it's a very sensitive one. And yes. you know, any attorney general that would go out on a limb and try to make some universal settlement of one of these enormous issues in front of the nation, particularly, particularly if you're abrogating the sovereignty of the Cherokee Nation or the voice of the Cherokee people, that would be insane. You know, I've gone to jail defending the laws of the Cherokee Nation. Thank you. Ms. Corey George. I want to thank you for coming before this body, and I know I placed a real hard burden on you last month when I asked you to weigh in on this issue. I could see some problems with this law, I could see it appear to be in conflict with our Constitution, but I wanted a, a neutral set of eyes to look at it, and I appreciate your candor with this committee so that now we can maybe make an informed decision. And thank you for your service. You're welcome. And Ms. Kalmos. Thank you. If there's no objection from the committee at this time, I'll withdraw it because I believe a lot of my concerns have been answered and addressed. If not, I'll bring it back in a different fashion, and I appreciate the advice of the Attorney General. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I do, too, is withdraw uh, her sponsor's request. Wow. Yeah, under new business, we come to item 8, an act uh, amending Legislative Act 1696, providing that the Cherokee Nation Tribal Council and Hitchcock Group should be the entity that represents the ownership interests of corporations or entities owned by the Cherokee Nation. Mr. Dalton. Yes. Uh, I would like to put this act into a formal motion. Second. Moved and second. Now discussion. Discussion. Yes, Mr. Hopkin. I wonder if Councilor Thornton or Todd could just kind of give us a brief overview. Of the intent of the legislation is to, uh, uh, in any corporation in which the 
Cherokee Nation is the owner or a majority owner thereof that the uh, entity that uh, uh, is that represents the shareholders who are the Cherokee people. The entities that uh, would, would represent those shareholders would be the principal chief and the tribal council. Uh, currently, uh, the, uh, the, principal, uh, the principal chief uh, has uh, and has for time immemorial been the representative of the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Cherokee people or the shareholders in, in this instance. This act uh, would uh, would make it law that uh, that both the council and the principal chief would share that responsibility. Point of order. Her. Was the motion made on the act that was in the book or the act that was passed down? Act that was passed down. Yeah. And 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 there's two. There was a there was just a, a scrivener's errors that uh, we had changed uh, the, the the title of the bill and the purpose of the bill, but we did not actually change the substantive provisions. So we added principal chief uh, uh, right. in the applicable places. Right. I, yeah. I see the difference. That's why I wanted to be sure which were. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Uh, Mr. Hoskin, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. I what are some scenarios in which right now the principal chief acts in the capacity of a shareholder? Can you give us some examples? Because that will illustrate for us what we might be doing in concert with the principal chief in the future. In that regard, I would defer to Mr. Bob Huffman, who is the uh, chief counsel for Cherokee Nation Businesses, and he could probably better aptly describe what the role of the shareholder representative is at this point. Okay. Mr. Huffman, thanks for being Thank you. here today. Uh, and, and you're going to speak to what the principal chief has done in the past in that capacity, yes. not just some theoretical concept. No, no. In, <clears throat> under the operating agreement of CNB, the principal chief acts as the nation's representative. And basically what he does is he nominates board members, and those are approved by the tribal council. He can also remove the board members, but that has to be approved by the tribal council. Uh, <clears throat> and he can... Uh, and I don't think he's done this in the past, amend certain provisions of the operating agreement that don't affect the tribal council's rights to approve. And that's essentially it. Can you give us an example of a change, of, of such a change? Because this is the exact type of change that we would be having a seat at the table at if we enacted this. Yeah, uh, well, ordinarily we don't, we don't amend the operating agreement very often. But it's usually minor things, such as the change in the uh, service agent, for example, <coughs> things like that. This, this sounds like it's largely pro forma stuff. I, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but um, I'm just trying to think of, is, is there a time down the road where there may be some controversy in which there's some disunity between the two branches and that in turn has an impact on corporate governance? I don't know. I, I'm asking you to speculate, so I won't ask you to do that. But that's the only—that's what I'm wondering. Um, and Todd, can you think of scenarios in which down the road this could cause any kind of an, an issue? I mean, we can resolve them. We have issues all the time. But I'm just wondering. Well, the one thing is that the uh, CNB, uh, uh, just like any other entity or, uh, or department of the Cherokee Nation, um, uh, is uh, controlled by the laws of the Cherokee Nation, laws that the council uh, creates and the uh, principal chief uh, executes. Um, now, the, uh, from, from what Mr. Huffman said that the, uh, the, the shareholder uh, activity um, is uh, uh, three principal things. Well, two of them the council is already involved in. Uh, that is the, uh, the appointment and the removal of board of directors. Now, let's all re remember that it's the board of directors that actually uh, sets the policy for the corporation, okay? And we have, uh, for, for the, the past 12 years, have, uh, have preached that let's keep government government and let's keep, uh, or, or let's keep politics politics and business business. So uh, it, it, at any time when there is a bleeding of the two, uh, it usually ends up bad for the, for the, for the, the, the tribe, uh, for, for that tribe. Uh, here, um, the only thing, if I, uh, and if I misspeak, Mr. Huffman, correct me, the only thing that the principal chief can do that doesn't involve the council is amend the uh, uh, operating agreement. 
uh, I've read the oper operating agreement, I'm, uh, but I will confess that I'm not an expert at it. Um, but uh, uh, anything that, uh, uh, for, for instance, the operating agreement doesn't uh, uh, control hiring and firing of people. The operating agreement does not control what dividends are uh, uh, given back to the nation. That's done by the laws of the nation. Uh, so, uh, and also the principal chief cannot uh, 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 on his own or her own uh, uh, change uh, uh, the removal or the appointment of the directors. Uh, so, uh, so like I said, two of the three things that the shareholders can do, the, the council is already involved in. Um, uh, now, is it always, you know, uh, and, and I, I, I've said it once and I'll say it uh, uh, again and again. I'm in favor of the, the council having as much authority as possible in every aspect of the Cherokee Nation. Um, so uh, uh, if it's pro forma, why not have it? But if it's, again, if it's pro forma, you know, why have it? That's a question for you all to answer. Well, I, is there any constitution, and you just sit down, Todd, I'm sorry, I should have uh, spoken quicker. Any constitutional concerns that you have? And, uh, and, and I did ask the councilman too, uh, but I was curious from our I think, attorney. I think inside the act, <clears throat> Article 7, I mean Article 10, Section 7, and I think that every councilman needs to be aware of this. I think you have overlooked it. I don't know what's happened in the past. Something's happened. And the credit of the Cherokee Pension should not be given pledged or loan to any individual, firm, company, corporation. Now, this is the Constitution. Our association without the approval of the council. The Cherokee Nation shall not make any donations by gift, bonus, or otherwise to any individual. This has been firm, company, corporation, or association without the approval of the council. To me, that's, that's uh, in other words, when you was elected to be a counselor, you was put in trust over any land, property, accounts of money. And right now, I'm telling each one of you councilmen, because I've been through it, you don't have standing with CMB. In other words, you can uh, go and file a, a case or file for uh, something that's happened that, that has been what I would call wrong. In other words, a theft, a, anything within CMB, you don't have any standing to do that. You can't take that federal court and prosecute anybody. And I want you to understand that. And if you think neglect of duty don't fall under this, this is a willful neglect of duty because you're not following the Constitution as it reads. And so, you know, I don't, uh, I've, I've always felt this way. I don't know why, uh, you know, some of us others don't feel that way. But what this mainly is, is setting up a purpose for this act is any business corporation entity wholly owned by the Cherokee Nation or which Cherokee Nation owns majority interest. The entity which shall represent the shareholders, which I always thought we were shareholders until we went to court. And I found out we're not shareholders in, in, business, in the business world. And uh, I, I want you to know that, uh, you know, shareholders should vote all the stocks, shares of stocks, or interest <coughs> shall be the principal chief and the Cherokee Nation Tribal Council. The tribal Council and the principal chief, chief shall get together and adopt procedures. In other words, we need to get with the, count, with the chief and his administration and adopt procedures for this because there's really not any set. And I don't have any problem with the way things are going. The thing that I have a problem with is that I'm not a shareholder, of which I should be, according to Article 10, Section 7 of the Constitution. And by that, I don't, I don't, I don't have standing as a councilman, and this has cost me dearly in the past. And I want to tell you, if you get in the situation where you've got to go to court and, and file on someone or somebody or some company, 
you'll end up knee deep in paying for this yourself. And all you're trying to do is protect the Cherokee Nation and, and its entities. So that's the reason this was brought forward. And uh, I think it has a good purpose. I think it should be done. It's a, it, it's a constitution. Uh, you know, the Kent should have the power to establish all laws, which is deemed necessary, proper for the good of the nation, which shall not be con uh, contrary to the pro provisions of this Constitution. And uh, I, I can't understand. I can't understand why we want to vote against our own job. And that's part of our job. And if you don't see it as part of your job, you better turn around and take another look at it. So that's all I've got to say about it. Thank you. I, can, uh, I, I bet you asked him for an explanation. I did, and I appreciate that explanation. I hope the councilman doesn't take questions about it as opposition, because <laughs> it's not. It's curiosity about the impact and the intent. Um, Todd, he, he, I think the councilman has alluded to maybe our standing to sue in the capacity of a shareholder, for example. <clears throat> I mean, is that something that this will empower us to do that we couldn't do before? If you're a shareholder, obviously you'd have standing to, to bring a, a, a suit uh, to, to enforce the, the shareholder's rights, you know, which any derivative suit could, 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 could do. Um, and, and as Councilman Thornton stated in Article 10 of, of the, uh, uh, the Cherokee Nation Constitution, which has been backed up by uh, a number of cases, is that the uh, the financial responsibilities of the tribal council are, are, are huge, uh, and that uh, we all understand that the um, um, that not only this governmental money is a responsible responsibility of the Cherokee Nation Tribal Council, but but uh, the uh, uh, the entity's money is also the Cherokee people's money, and and you have a, a, a fiduciary duty oversight on that also. If we, as a council member, saw something happening about which we wanted to sue as a shareholder, we would have to get, well, we have to get approval from this body and then under this act, we'd also have to get consensus with the principal chief. Is that right? Or could we as individual council members on our own under this act have some stand? Well, that's, that will be the details that we'd have to work out as to what stand, what, you know, how would you uh, 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 bring forth a, a lawsuit? Um, and also we have, and I know the Attorney General is still here, um, you know, the, uh, how does this play vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, uh, the Attorney General's Act and the uh, portion of the Constitution as to the Attorney General. Uh, and, and I would, uh, would assume that the, uh, the Principal Chief uh, would, uh, uh, would also promote his own uh, constitutional responsibility, say, you know, say wait, uh, under Article, uh, I believe it's 7, Section 9 of the Constitution, I conduct the business of the nation. I'm sure he would raise that point. So, I mean, there, there are, you know, uh, competing, you know, or no, I wouldn't say competing, but different constitutional uh, provisions that we, we have to, to, to look at. This, especially under the auspices of Article 10, uh, would, would increase the financial uh, oversight ability of the, tribal, uh, of the Tribal Council. Now, does that give... Um, uh, a major uh, an individual right to sue? I don't know. Does it give a majority of this council uh, a right to sue? I don't know. I think basically the, the, the issue of standing should be addressed in, in another piece of uh, uh, legislation so that we all know for a fact that the councilmen have a right to sue because I would agree with Mr. Thornton, although I did not represent the, that group of uh, councilors in that instance, you know, uh, that uh, when, when the, the councilors see, uh, much like Jiggs Phillips did uh, when he brought his lawsuit, uh, which was prior to the 1999 Constitution, I understand that. But, uh, you know, uh, that individual counselor had a right to bring suit and, and did. Um, and again, as I said in the past, you'll never see a, a, a bigger promoter of the, for the strength of the, the uh, tribal council than, than, than myself. Anything that I can do to strengthen the individual members and also the council as a whole, I think, is a, is a good thing. Uh, and you know, uh, I'm sure there will be constitutional arguments on the other uh, on the other side. But you know, we're we're selling this, uh, uh, we're we're sailing this ship, so to speak. Good. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fitching. Uh, I was just going to ask uh, David if he would mind me being a sponsor on that, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Callum Watts. 
Thank you. I would also like to be added as a sponsor, um, and then I will take up the issue maybe at next rules or January's rules. And I don't know if Mr. Thornton, <coughs> Councilman Thornton, would too that that have litigate or the act to create standing for council members and clear the air on that Jude Phillips case that came forward. Um, but what I saw lacking. Uh, the way I understood the shareholder uh, situation, because I was excited about this litigation or the act coming forward, excuse me, because in the past, I think that the board has tried to hear our concerns, um, has uh, you know been very gracious about our, the time at, at uh, CME board meetings or individual board meetings or taking phone calls. Uh, but ultimately, they took orders from the, the chief, uh, and there were memos issued that were dis directives and policy. So when this act came forward, um, I thought that it would be more intentional in that part. Yes, we already knew we had these other involvements. Uh, there was all the, the board policy and the hiring and firing and nominations and confirmations of nominations. All that was out. What I thought this act actually addressed was the idea that we then would be able to participate and do provide checks and balances with directives given our businesses to make sure that maybe there wasn't a single point of failure or that that we had just equal standing with the executive branch um, maybe but i saw that missing from the historical record given that that was the other component of the principal chief as representative shareholder would also provide uh, beyond our advisory board members so I don't know if anybody has any comment on that but that's what I saw and I thought that was missing Mr. Thank you. You want to respond? I don't uh, actually see it missing out of here I think section 5A and B uh, and I think we could point a subcommittee a subcommittee to go through this and uh, you know tribal council and the principal sheet so adopt procedures and that would be part of the procedure that would get in there and argue about, you know. And so I don't see any part of it really missing here. The historical record. The part that has missed before. Right. Is what I'm. Okay, we agree. Okay. And all this county. Yes, and so I, January, if, if possible, on the rules agenda for the other item. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Adam, if this passes. It needs to have done it, whether it passes or not. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Keener. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, yes, I, I share the uh, statement made by the good counselor of Sequoia County, uh, David Thornton. That is a uh, very good uh, uh, act. I strongly urge everyone to vote for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think okay. Councilors uh, uh, Watts uh, comment uh, is addressed in the last, last uh, sentence of sections A and B. Looking forward to effectuating those provisions. So uh, I guess that uh, uh, I, I too have been uh, involved with the C and B, and I think it is time to do this, and I, I urge its passing. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Keener. Mr. Lay. Thank you, ma'am. I'd like to be put on as a sponsor if it's okay with the council. Mm -hmm. This is a good idea. And part of the records and all that in fiscal article 10, section 4, mm -hmm. the council shall require that all of those monies, funds, accounts, indebtedness, and all that, it's all right here in this constitution. I don't know that it's this council's been allowed to do these things, but it's time they've done I put that in there. I had to put it in there twice because the lawyer took it out once. <laughs> and so it's there for us to use if we just got the muscle to do it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Are you Thank blaming you. Todd for that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any, oh, Mr. Keener, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I too would like to get as a sponsor before, uh, because this, this question gets called. And I uh, also wanted to challenge Todd, uh, who, is a, who is the most uh, big proponent of the strongest council. So I, I would challenge his role as that. Uh, I, uh, I, I throw, throw the gauntlet down. <laughs> okay, it's on. 
game on with it. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Yes, I did want to get, uh, I wanted uh, both Mr. Stewart and Ms. Hammonds as the Attorney General just to kind of weigh in on this issue. I wanted to hear their comments on whether there are any constitutional problems that are perceived or any uh, uh, ability to work uh, with this particular act should it pass. Could we get them to come up sure. and maybe give Mr. us some? You want Mr. Stewart to answer what part of it? Uh, the working well, part? Well, the day-to-day -day operations, uh, meeting-wise, uh, what kind of effect it might have on Mr. Stewart, you want to come forward? Organization. Sure. Uh, you know, I think overall this is a good idea because <laughs> all of you need to know what's going on. It's a very complex organization. Uh, and all of the meetings and all the procedures that we have, I don't think anybody has an, any idea how deep they go. Uh, but what we can't do is slow down the business. So what I would advise is that as a council that you deal with the board members and establish those kinds of policies and procedures to the extent that you want to. Uh, we already have a, you know, volumes of procedures that protect the company uh, and that board of directors uh, uh, directs uh, me uh, to direct management. I mean that's how the hierarchy works, board of directors uh, essentially tells me what to do and then I uh, direct the company. So what we, what I would advise you not to do is to go below the board of directors and myself so that all of you are talking to employees and changing their job descriptions and hiring and firing them and that, you know, that's going to be a disaster. That, we, and, and I know it, but it's, it's going to be easy to do. It's really difficult even for the board of directors to understand that they really can't go direct people what to do, that's my job. And as soon as we start doing that, you know, you've got, I don't know how many of you have kids, but you know, if one parent is telling the kid one thing and the other parent, you know, eats sweets and the other one says eat green beans, you're gonna have a screwed up kid, right? And, and, and that's what would happen to the business. This is how uh, the Creeks do it. Uh, and it doesn't work, honestly. They are able to have involvement with employees and that's the most disruptive business principle that we can have. Now, most tribes look to us as a model business uh, entity. They, they call us, they wanna know how we do it, they want what we have, and that is we have entrepreneurship, we are aggressive, we're able to make decisions, I'm able to make business decisions quickly based on the board of directors uh, strategy and input. So they basically say, here's well, where we want to go, and they say, Dave, tell us how to get there, and then we work together to figure that out. So as long as uh, the involvement is at the board of directors level, and then I am able to run the company effectively, aggressively, and entrepreneurially, then we will be successful. If it is different, it will destroy the many years that we've tried to develop a very tight business organization based on good business decisions, good strategy and, 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 and good tactics. Now all that's directed by the board. So the board of directors is really where I see the council needs to get with them and myself to, to let's get a direction that everybody likes. And then that direction then goes to management and management affects that direction. That's how business principles work. Mr. Callum, why do you want point of information? Yeah, so you're saying that the chief's order for free and open discussion with council and him and whatever else, that does not apply to your business entity and the employees? Uh, I'm not sure I'm not understanding. Well, I'm just, there was an executive order. Oh, no, no, you can talk. Talking is one thing. Firing people is another. Employees have rights, and I mean, all those things, all those business principles, are in effect and they are policy decisions. But anybody can talk to anybody, that's not a problem. But you're, so maybe, I think hiring and firing, first of those, that's maybe even oversimplifying here, but personnel this issues. This oh, you can talk, anybody can talk to anybody about okay. anything. I mean, there's, there's no, this is America. We can, yeah, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. That's enough. Okay. Uh, Mr. Garvin. Yes, I'd like to be included as a sponsor of David approval. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry, she was talking to me. Please, just one person talking. Uh, speaker, don't 
Do I still have the floor? I had deferred to him, but I also wanted to hear from Diane Hammond. Yeah, yes, she would ask for a point of information now. It's yours. Okay. Was that okay. everything, David? Yeah. Okay. I would like to hear Ms. Hammond's comments on it. Mr. Henry pointed out to you the um, constitutional um, possible infirmity, and that's in Article 7 of the, it's entitled Executive Section 9, the Principal Chief, um, those laws of Cherokee Nation be faithfully executed and shall conduct in person, and in such manner shall be prescribed by law all communications and business of the Cherokee Nation. Now, I don't know... You guys all know where the devil is, I in the details. Um, so I don't know, I don't know how this act is um, going to be effectuated if, if the intent of the act is to give individual tribal council members standing to sue the business or the directors, then just say that would be my, I guess, practical and legal advice. Um, because you're already the shareholders of the business, as am I, as is my cousin and my aunt. I mean, the Cherokee Nation is the shareholder. You've heard what the practical effect, what the chief's practical um, individual duties have been. So, uh, you know, that would be my advice. It would be to make it more specific and to try to effectuate what it is that you're really trying to effectuate. And I guess the only other comment I would have, which is probably beyond what you asked me, uh, council member, is that um, we were talking about, um, we're referring to the GEG and um, those lawsuits. Those lawsuits were purported to be brought in the name of the nation, and that was the problem. Um, and then there was also the issue of standing. Standing is something that could be addressed, um, I believe, by statute. You can convey standing by statute. Uh, for example, Federal Tort Claims Acts convey standing upon certain classes of individuals for certain classes of wrongs where they otherwise would not have it. Um, so I believe that that is something that you could do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barker? Uh, I interrupted a minute ago and asked David if I could be a sponsor. Mm -hmm. He said yes, but I guess we was out of order, so I'll ask again. Yes. Uh, sure, anyone wants. Thank you. Yes, uh, I think we're getting off the purpose of this. The purpose of this is not to run the businesses in the corporation. That's up to David. Or not to run the board. I don't see any changes here except if I holler at my CPA or he hollers at me and he says, hey, this business don't own. 51% of shares of this business. The Cherokee Nation don't own it. Or if he says, uh, hey, this business is really in Dutch and we're putting millions of dollars into it, and I don't think it's going to come out of it. So there, we can, we can right now, as a Cherokee member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, you don't have standing in that business. That's been tested already. I don't care who comes up here and tells you you do. You don't have it. Uh, so that's primarily what this is for. And it's not to, to butt our nose into the uh, business corporations over there. It's for us to ask questions and, and be answered. You know, I've asked questions over there. Some of the answers I got were right. Several of the answers I got didn't even pertain what was wrong, and some of them I didn't get an answer. So there's things I'd like to ask over there that, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to have answers for. Another thing is that uh, when we're talking about donations and pledges by business, you know, I want to know where all these pledges and donations are going. I go out in my district and I've got townships, communities that's been pledged and given funding and it's a good purpose. But I want to know it before it happens 
because I may want to be in on it. I don't know if any of you all understand that or not, but I don't like it just being an open book that we're going to give somebody so much money and, and a month or a day or, or for anything unless we're in on it. And we haven't been in on it, folks. So I would appreciate your support in this. And I, I would ask that anyone that wants to uh, uh, be a sponsor of this, would you say so? And, and what, if you hadn't already said so, and uh, raise your hand or whatever. If you don't want to be, that's fine with me. But, looks like we got one over there. No, we got two. Yeah, I'd like to be in this sponsor. Me too. Are you finished with your turn? Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Keener? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, yes, I, I'm still going to vote for this and to allay David's fears. Um, I never thought beyond the Board of Directors, speaking for myself, um, so I do think that uh, he makes a good point in keeping the council, the, the administrative office, and the board uh, all on one page and, and not go beyond that. Uh, I think that would be ruinous to us. And um, Attorney General Hammonds is absolutely correct. The devil is in the details, and that's provided for in this act. So I look forward again to... Uh, having a subcommittee and discussing all those things and I really believe that our, our public trust uh, our public service as a council is a public trust so uh, that's why I'm supporting this thank you madam speaker thank you yes mr. Watkins uh, just clarification on the responsibility of the CMB board uh, whenever there's money that, that's being contributed or, or donated or whatever the CMB board goes and they approve those donations, correct, Mr. Stewart? No, no, they do not. We, we have a, can I? Sure, yeah. please, come um, forward. We have a sponsorship committee made up of, it's a cross-functional group of people within the company, and we have to have a causal relationship to the business. Sometimes that gets askew, but like, uh, we would sponsor something for the American Heart Association where our employees get involved and so we would make a donation uh, so we do a lot of that just as our community goodwill and it's not a problem at all to get everybody involved in that I mean I know that's a you know we've always talked about that for the past years and we try to limit that uh, but it, it goes on all the time I and mean, we have rodeos we have all this stuff going on in the 14 counties and honestly it, it does get out of control sometimes and, and I would welcome any kind of input but we do have this committee that they vote on it and then we do it but they just don't it doesn't just come in and we go yeah we're going to write a check for that so we can change that process but that's absolutely not a problem is, is this committee is this a, a a paid committee or is this a volunteer committee these are our employees we have employees that are involved in the company and so they take those sponsorships and they make a decision they have kind of an overall budget and then they have an overall plan for the year and then they use those they have a set amount of funds that they can do for sponsorships and so it's part of our community goodwill so for example in Tulsa you know we want a good name for Hard Rock right so we would sponsor uh, the American Diabetes Association in the name of Hard Rock and that's to let the community know that we are giving back to the community that's the whole purpose of these sponsorships okay it's for goodwill purposes. Um, so we would be taking responsibility from that committee on those donations and approving those donations, correct? No. Well, I mean. That, 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 that's, that's not the part of this act, okay? Uh, now, you know, you're talking about one, you know, uh, you know, you're, you're talking about something that would be discussed in the subcommittee in developing the procedures. You know, uh, again, I would echo uh, the, the least amount of involvement in the tribal council on the day-to-day -day decisions, whether that's making a donation or whether that's hiring and firing, should be done by the tribal council. You know, uh, the, the board of directors hires and fires one person, yeah. the CEO, uh, okay? The, uh, the tribal council hire and, hires and fires the board of directors. Sure. That's, you know, that's the way it works, okay? 
Uh, so, I, you know, on, on anything that, that, uh, that would have to deal with uh, making decisions on, you know, whether C and B is going to sponsor, you know, the, uh, a team of for Relay for Life in Catoosa or anything like that, I wouldn't, I, I would, you know, that, you know once, you, once you start getting into that kind of detail, well, then it's going to be real easy to get into other details. Like they says, you know, once you get the nose of the cam, camel under, under the tent, pretty soon you've got the whole camel in there. So, you know, uh, let's, let's keep, you know, let, let's keep it again, you know, when, you know, if this act passes and it passes full council and, it, and, and it, it's signed by the principal chief, you're going to start developing uh, a policy and procedures how to enact it. And when, when we get to that stage, if we get to that stage, we need to make sure that uh, the, uh, the level of the operation of the council is on the highest level, you know, and, and that would be my advice to the council. Uh, Mr. Chamber? Yes. So, would you say that? I mean, would you approve this legislation? I mean, if I, you know, fortunately, the people of South Adair County have not represented elected me. Mr. Stewart said he would support it. Yes. Well, here, go. let me. Now, I'm asking you. I would like to just a moment. Put on that point. Said you have the floor. <laughs> Let him finish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what? Okay. Well, what, what, I don't feel comfortable in saying do I personally support a piece of legislation. Uh, that that is not what my job is here to do. My job is to write pieces okay. of legislation. All right. You know, Mr. So, Stewart. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I support the idea and the concept that this council understand what the strategies, the tactics, and the uh, directives or initiatives of the company and what's going on. I mean, I, this full discount, they're available. They've been made available to all advisory members. We send those over to you. We've got volumes of strategy, budgets, procedures. All of those are available for you to review. I think that the, all of those strategies you, sh you might want to have input in. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think you're responsible for the affairs of, of the government. But there's a point where that you need to say, this is where we want you to go, and that's at about a 30,000 foot level. Yeah. Then you have a board of directors, and you tell the board of directors what you want. And then the board of directors does the layman's work for the business, okay? Beyond that, I don't believe this council wants to be involved, nor should they be involved in any more detail. Now, will you be the judge of what parts we're going to be involved with and what parts we won't be involved with? No. Well, well the, the 30, yeah, I, I, I think it's a 30,000 foot level that you're talking if about. If I would say you're at 30,000 feet, then I think that's a pretty easy. It's a strategy, it's implementation, it's how are you going to go about it? Fundamental principles on which we run the business. Uh, but if you start getting into the wordsmith of individual policies and procedures on the way we operate, you all will not have any time left in your day. Exactly. Yeah. So you do, I don't think that's advisable for you to do that. So if you limit your, your discussion and input with the board of directors on strategy, overarching policy, and initiatives, I think that's what this legislation should allow you to have input on. Mm -hmm. I think any more invasive authority in the organization is not healthy. I just be honest. I just think, uh, you, you know, you talk about what could be done or if it's proposed. You don't want an act that will allow that much, you know, in-depth influence into the company. You need to let it operate. I mean, this is a the board of directors, CEO, management concept is fundamental to business. And so if you would stay at a shareholder level, and there are, there are standard <coughs> things that the shareholder tells the board. We want to, for example, can I give some examples or is everybody ready to go home? Well, um, okay. uh, if you're what I'm saying, the 30,000 foot level, how much income you want, how many jobs you want, how much bottom line profits you want, those are the things you need to direct you know, Cherokee employment percent, you know, those kinds of th fundamental things, those are the things you should be involved in. I, uh, I think we need to be more specific in, in this 
amendment because later on, eight years down the road, 12 years down the road, we don't want someone to come in here and take advantage and go a step further. I'm trying to be proactive. And I want to stay at the 30,000 foot level. And what Mr. Stewart said with the policies and the, uh, what else you say? Procedure. Well, Procedure. you want to stay at the strategic level. Yeah. And if you can come up with words and maybe this subcommittee could maybe work on that, I don't, I don't know. That, 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 that's just kind of what, what I'm trying to get at. I, uh, and maybe if we made a friendly amendment to uh, Councilor Thornton on, uh, I don't know how to word this. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure on, on the word, the verb is to use. Well, stra strategic business objectives. Strategic if, uh, business objectives. Is, is a good uh, one. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, you, you asked me? Yeah. I'm going to say no, and the reason I'm saying no is I always got on one lady that was in this council from way back, mm -hmm. and it's because she didn't read the act, and she wouldn't read the last part of it. And I mean, this is telling you that you're going to have a subcommittee that will bring this forward, and you'll be able to voice your opinion in there on how much you want to be involved. We're not in here to be involved in the daily, daily operations of the of the business. We're not in here. If he's got a board appointed to to uh, give out uh, uh, donations, fine with me. I don't have a problem with it. I do have a problem not knowing it. And, you know, when I go into a, a, a township and sit down in a police room, and like I did this last year, and they say, hey, do you know we're getting so much money a month from seeing me over here for... <laughs> No, I don't know it. <laughs> and, you know, it'd be nice just to know that type of thing because there's things that you deal with in each one of those townships where you might can help them uh, also in another way. But that's all I want to do is information. I don't want to be in with running the corporation. And I think David knows that. I don't think he has any problem with that. The only thing that I've got a problem with is uh, uh, not having standing and not being a uh, shareholder. And by not being a shareholder, you don't have standing. I, I don't know how much I'll preach this. But anyway, that's what that subcommittee's for. If you would like to be a member of it, I'd appreciate it. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Chair. Can I call for the question, please? The question has been called. Anyone that wants to say something before we go on that hasn't spoke? Uh, you want this by acclamation, Mr. Thornton? No. Okay. Roll call. Yes, you support this legislation. Kara Callan Watts? Yes. Bill Anglin? Yes. Jack Baker? Yes. Julia Coates? Yes. Jody Fishinghawk? Yes. Meredith Fraley? Yes. Janelle Fulbright? Yes. Don Garvin? Yes. Chuck Hoskin Jr. Tina Glory Jordan? Yes. Lee Keener? Yes. Dick Lay? Yes. Curtis Snell? David Thornton? Yes. David Watkins did? No. We have 12 yes and one no. 12 yes and one no. Legislation and the motion carries. Okay, item nine is information of a independent not, uh, information technology service for the council. Uh, uh, Chuck asked us to table this for one month. Okay, I have a motion to table. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All in favor of table it until next month, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, item 10 is development of 15 separate council districts for the Cherokee Nation Tribal Council. Mr. Thornton. Uh, since we've had such a long day, I, like, I, I really don't want to table this because I think we need to get on it just as quick as we can get on it. Uh, <coughs> we've got two more meetings. 
Oh, you're looking for a table, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the floor. Uh, Tara, do you have an idea? Yeah, if we could take 10 minutes since the staff has already been waiting and okay. just hear from them where they're at on data right now, or maybe five. Okay. Just where we're at. Uh, then I'd like to make, I'd like to make a motion on this. Uh, I'll make a motion that we accept this 15 district. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? It's for no. discussion only. What do the 15 districts look like and where's the data at right now? <laughs> Madam Chairman, we th this this item's for discussion only, and so we cannot take any action. So we can't approve a 15 districts a, a, at this time. The the act that you passed previously said you took that you would revisit it. This is the beginning of that revisiting process. There are staff members here uh, that have been waiting. Uh, Ms. Callan Watts uh, uh, has asked that they uh, uh, present what data they have in a very brief fashion, so we can start the discussion on this and then keep this maybe as a regular uh, uh, agenda item or. Uh, whatever the uh, the council would like to see to, to, to forward this position on. It's your, it's your pleasure. You're the sponsor. I'd like to forward it on and keep it as a regular agenda item for next month. For next month? Mm -hmm. Okay, Ms. Callum Watts. I would love to hear from the staff for just even a few minutes about where okay, we're at. Yeah, we'll take five minutes. Okay, thank we you. We've got two more. Thank you. Go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Five minutes. You already used two of them. Okay. Uh, uh, Councilor Fishing Hawk had requested that we collect some data, um, and I apologize we didn't get this to you earlier. Um, the registrar is out on sick leave, and um, yeah, her staff is uh, was out of the office yesterday. Uh, so I got some data together. Uh, from from that staff and kind of gives you an idea of the districts we also extracted the data as of uh, yesterday morning at, as you requested and set it aside and uh, since we've been in the meeting I've been reviewing the numbers making sure that they're accurate and reflective of uh, our process uh, now I will say one thing the information on this report is going to fluctuate because that is by some of the old district counts, and it's, a, it's not a report that's completely reflective of what you guys will be analyzing, but it kind of gives you an idea of the total citizenship count, how many uh, still have bad addresses, uh, but we haven't done any major analysis at this point. We just set aside the data, and this is a snapshot. Okay, Ms. Watts. Thank you. We're heading down the same court yes. tunnel when you hand out information like this. I have no other way to explain it. This is not reflecting the current districts. Um, we don't even know if we'll stay with county lines. The court was very clear that we have to place the last known address, even if it's a bad address, in that community where those people are from. This is erroneous in that, in that if this reaches the public and there's no background information, we're going to have confusion again about the reality of where population sits. And we, where are we at in the whole process of geodata coding on GIS with the counties? Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. frustrated. And that, Sorry, that's, Madam Speaker. Well, I was trying to satisfy the request that uh, Councilor Fishing Hawk uh, had made on Sunday, uh, trying to supply at least some data to give you a snapshot of where we are. She requested that we do a set aside of the data. So, getting prepared for that, we did set aside the data. Mr. Uh, do you know when you can bring that forward? current yes information yeah i mean it? i'll have it we'll have it by next month uh ready to analyze you have prior to next month so the council can absolutely review. yeah in fact we could probably release the the summary counts and again it's going to be by county uh, just for comparison study and analysis of looking at at this point in a tabular format uh, we can provide tabular information and maps uh, by the end of uh, probably by the end of this week of by zip code and how the how that looks now the I have been reporting every month the two projects that we have going on um, one is the project with no water county that PO uh, has been released to the party uh, SDR and they will begin work so we will have that data uh, hopefully by the end of the year and that is, there is no 911 coding um, started or in process until we 
implemented this contract with SDR. Um, the other project uh, is reconciling those citizens, and there's about 25,000 citizens with PO addresses that live inside the 14 county jurisdiction. Without a valid legal street address, we cannot geocode and know where those citizens are. That uh, process, those letters will go out next week alerting those citizens that we need them to up update their PO address to a legal street address so that we can verify their 911 address and provide location specific information for every citizen. One last question, please, for consideration. How are you going to get how are you going to get the current addresses for the 21,940 with bad addresses? At this point we have no way of contacting them. Uh, their addresses uh, have been flagged as bad. We don't have any way of contacting them um, whatsoever other than doing a mass newspaper like uh, the IRS may do of saying you have a bad address listed in registration and run that in the Phoenix, but you're looking at you know, close to 21,000, 22,000 citizens uh, that are flagged with a bad address. And we've we simply lost contact with them and we can't we can't reach them until they come back in and and uh, file an update with registration thank you okay one one minute each because we really need to get on we've got two more committee meetings mr lay and who else uh, mr baker one minute thank you uh, we have some people living who, who's going to have a zip code it's like if they live in White Oak mm -hmm. their zip code is going to be out of Chelsea. Chelsea right. Rogers County, White Oak's credit. We have every county that I have is like that. Mm -hmm. And also uh, these, these bad addresses, they vote, some of them. Um, you can't you can't mail them. I, I have to go back and double check that. Yeah, uh, I, I can, did. I can tell you. That. I did find that we had somebody that did vote that was marked with a bad address in the registration system, and they had the exact same address um, in the election commission. How they are getting notification other than just word of mouth? The election commission hasn't been able to connect with and, them either. And where are you getting your addresses from the election commission? No, uh, those two systems are separate. Uh, the registration is the keeper of the official address for that citizen, uh, and then the election commission keeps a separate separate record for voters only. Ten seconds. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're putting the pressure on. Uh, Mr. Ahead, Baker, one this. minute. Will you give us the preliminary report? You said you do it by county. Can you also do it by county by zip code? Yes. Oh, no, realizing that. The zip codes cross county lines, but nevertheless, this is by zip code. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Was there another staff person that you said staff? Is he the only one? David Justice was here, but David I don't know. David going back I was, there. I'm just here to answer questions. <laughs> He's like, hey, no. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Todd. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. any announcements? Second. Second. <laughs> Attorney, say goodbye, say goodbye. Aye. 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 Aye.